This conference will now be recorded. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, 9.02 a.m. on July 13, 2021. This is session six in the appeal hearing under UZDP 2019-00562. Before we start with our continuation of testimony, um, I do want to make the following note. If I recall correctly, there was some discussion yesterday as to whether or not Exhibit 1031 was a duplicate of Exhibit 35G. Um, it's not. Uh, exhibits 35H and G are quite similar. The matrix text in both is identical, but Exhibit 35H has substantial graphic augmentation, uh, I think done by Shook Kelly. Uh, so that version's a little different. The text is the same, uh, but it doesn't have the graphics. But either one of them is quite different from 1031 in the for whatever it's worth category. Okay. Um, Mr. Roos, you were questioning Mr. Zinzer. I think you were going to move on to the septet or however you say that. Uh, septet, yes, yeah, or septet. I, <laughs> that's right. That's right. We'll take so, care of a minute. Okay, thank you. And just to orient us, we are um, this appeal issue 14. It's on uh, pages 17 and 18 of the UZDP decision. The planning principle at issue here is. 21B.95.0501D, and that uh, subparagraph 1D refers to uh, both Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA standards, and what are called crime prevention through environmental design, SIPTED guidelines. So just to, just to orient us here. Um, Mr. Zinzer, turning now to the topic of SIPTED, did you address SIPTED in your application materi materials? Yes, in the 1031. And you're on, you may have, a, you, do, you have a, do you have a share screen control, Mr. Zinzer? If not, we may need to get that going again. I don't believe I have permissions. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Sugg, if you would give that permission to Mr. Zenzer. You now have it, sir. Go ahead. And we are on exhibit 1031, page 35, and I believe you're referring to the bottom there. Okay. Did the um, UZDP decision and its discussion of SIPTED discuss any of this portion of your application materials and your design companion? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, the decision concluded that the SIPTED analysis was flawed because it did not provide, quote, an illumination plan identifying lighting levels, end quote. That's at the bottom of page 17. Did you, in fact, provide an illumination plan in your materials? We did. That was one of the um, components to our approach to the SEPTED guidelines. And bullet number three, we explained that multiple overlapping lighting sources, including street lights, building lighting, open space, decorative lighting, would be included. And we referenced the landscape plans for the conceptual lighting locations. The um, well, go go ahead. Was there more that you wanted to say before I? 
proceed. Okay, so I believe you have some code references here. And these, I believe, correspond to the code references in the last paragraph of page 17 of the UZDP decision, which states that an illumination plant had not been provided requiring lighting levels as required by code provisions that you have up here on the screen. Can you, can you just walk through these code provisions and how you responded to them? Sure. 21B 3160 outlines the general requirements for all common pedestrian oriented and public open space, open space design criteria. The, the design of all common pedestrian oriented public open space required for, for 21B 30090 shall meet the following design criteria to the director's satisfaction. The project applicants shall demonstrate how the space incorporates crime prevention through environmental design septed principles, including lighting levels, according to 21B 30190, or as noted in this section. So if you look at 21B 30190, the site lighting levels, all publicly accessible areas shall be lighted with the average minimum and maximum levels as follows. For a minimum for low or non-pedestrian vehicular traffic areas of one half foot candle. For moderate, this is moderate or high volume pedestrian areas of one to two foot candles and maximum for high volume pedestrian areas and building entries of four foot candles. Foot candle is a measure of light intensity. The lighting shall be provided at consistent levels with gradual transitions between maximum and minimum levels of lighting between lit areas and unlit areas. Highly contrasting pools of light and dark areas shall be avoided. And C, sight lighting shall be metal highlight or LED unless an alternative is, is approved by the director. The other within section two of 21B 30160. Section two, pedestrian oriented open space design criteria. The following design elements are required for pedestrian oriented space. Pedestrian scale lighting, no more than 14 feet in height at a level averaging at least two foot candles throughout the space. Lighting may be on site or building mounted lighting. And let me just pause there. I think you may have just misread um... B says the following design elements are required for pedestrian oriented open space. I believe you may have open said space. I'm sorry. Open, open space. space, open space. Okay. Okay. So it gave you, it looks like it gave you two options. You're saying lighting levels according to citation two or lighting levels according to citation number three. Correct. Which did you, which did you incorporate? We looked at both. Um, You may need to blow up this document and, and I will get the reference number. This is page 35P, I'm sorry, exhibit 35P, page 31. And I believe it's a document specifically titled Illumination Plan in the right bar there. Can you blow up that right bar a little bit, Mr. Zinser? Okay, so that is that's that's showing as an illumination plan. Okay, go ahead and discuss what's shown here. 
So we're looking at a plan. Block five, six, seven. This is our pedestrian-oriented open space. We provide a lighting legend, which outlines three different lights. Pedestrian lights, tree down lights, and platform and stair LED strip lights. The symbology for those are indicated on the left. The open circle is the pedestrian light. The solid circle is the tree down light. And the dashed line is the platform and stair LED strip lights. On the right, you see specification identified for each of those light fixtures. I should mention also the quantity of each of those fixtures is listed to the left of each of the types. For the strip lights, it's in linear footage. So you see the approach to lighting is a combination of the pedestrian lights, which are pole mounted fixtures of 11 and a half feet high. And they are generally placed along the path of pedestrian traffic as we circulate through the space. tree mounted or post mounted lights are adjustable lights that would be fixed to trees and or structures within the space and they can be adjusted to direct into pedestrian pathways. Along the steps, the nosing of those steps would have the strip lights to illuminate those areas of pedestrian transition. The combination of this layered approach to lighting, we feel would provide adequate foot candle levels within the space. The landscape plan. This is this is exhibit 35P, page 33. There are details for each of the light fixtures that are specified on the illumination plan, which provides information on foot candles associated with each. And those those three type of those three type of lights again, maybe you can blow those just those squares up. So that's information on tree down lights. Tree down lights. Mm -hmm. Including this, candles. Correct. This was highlighted as part of the submittal to indicate the fixtures that were envisioned. This is the LED strip light for stair and platform locations. And then the pedestrian light fixture. We provided the first page of a two page document that describes that fixture. When I say we, I, I mean the, the design team, including um, 
the other consultants involved with the project. Did you do that? Did you do the, the other uh, highlighted sections that you have here, detailed row bench, or is that? I guess that's not a, that's not the light. So you 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 have highlighted the three types of lights. Okay. Okay. That's correct. Okay. Okay. You just these just happen to be composed on a, a sheet of landscape details that included some of the street scape furniture components. So we look at the information about each of these fixtures and the layering that we can achieve with the post and adjustable fixtures, as well as the low level strip lights in combination in the future as we get into advanced building design of illumination mounted on the building. We've demonstrated, I believe, an approach that will accommodate the foot candle levels required for the space. And again, the code section here, 21B.30.160, is titled Site Design Elements Open Space Design. Uh, Correct. So you were focused on the lighting within the open space portion. Right. Of For the, the street rights of way, that would be coordinated with public works and their street light design criteria and position accordingly. Did the city's UZDP decision and its discussion of SIPTED on pages 17 and 18 reference or acknowledge these site plans that you've been sharing and discussing? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, you now have some additional slides demonstrating what the lighting plan might look like. This is from Exhibit 1031, page 24. This is a conceptual illustration, if you recall, from yesterday inside the Green Spine Central Open Space. And we begun to layer in the lighting give an idea of what that space might look like in the evening with layered lighting, high, low, in a particular locations on the buildings to give an overall illumination within the space. Again, this as an approach to satisfying SIPTED guidelines for environmental design. Okay, and the only SIPTED related comment or basis for denial in the UZDP decision was the illumination, the, the alleged lack of an illumination plan. Is that correct? That's correct. The city raised no issues or concerns about other aspects of your SIPTED guideline plan. They did not.
Okay. Is there anything else on SIPTED that you wanted to mention in your testimony? Nope. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next issue, which is Appeal Issue 13. And it's pages, relates to pages 16 and 17 of the UZDP decision. By way of background, is it your understanding that the Town Center Development Code contains various criteria for obtaining either bonus commercial or residential development capacity under 21B.25.040? Yes. It provides the design criteria for awarding bonus commercial and residential development capacity. And so for project, go ahead. go ahead. It outlines several features that if designed to a higher level of performance, could make the project eligible for the additional bonus capacity. And that's a, a higher level of design performance than, quote, those specifically required in the town center development regulations, end quote. Is that's that correct? correct. That's in 0402B. And there's a list of features and any development seeking eligibility should incorporate at least five of the features listed. Okay, was this project seeking any bonus commercial or residential development capacity? No, it was not. So it was not seeking, nor did it require additional capacity that would require the incorporation of at least five of these features from the list of design criteria. That's correct. Okay, what was the purpose of your analysis on the right side here? The purpose was to list the features that would contribute to the eligibility for bonus and or commercial capacity in future phases. And you have that language in future phases in your response there. Perhaps you can blow that up. What's our exhibit reference while he's doing that, please? You bet, exhibit 1031. Page 46. Thank you. To repeat, a number of these design elements and development features will contribute to the project's eligibility for bonus commercial and or residential capacity under SMC 21B 25.0402B in future phases, including, and we listed several of the features that we felt would be contributing to that eligibility in the future. So I take it the idea was if in future phases or future build out outside the 8.09 project area, um, the applicant sought bonus commercial and residential development capacity 
it was asking the city to take account of perhaps certain features that were incorporated within these 8.09 acres. That's correct. Was there uncertainty in your mind in the code as to whether the special design features needed to be within the within the acreage of the project that sought those additional additional capacity or whether it could tie back to earlier phases? Is that the question? It was not specified, but we did not want to lose that ability to have this potentially enhance that eligibility in the future. So just by way of example, if this particular if blocks five and six and seven involved increased use of structured parking, could that be a design feature or design enhancement that would allow eligibility for bonus capacity in future phases outside the 8.09 acres? That's correct. Is it fair to say you were really just raising this question for just assuming that there would be further discussion with the city about this? Yes. This sheet that we're looking at now, was this also included in your original application materials from November 2019? Yes, it was. And was that specifically on in exhibit 13 C page 3-12? Yes. And you can take your time to check the exhibit. I want to get you have do you have the actual page number as opposed to the site plan number there? check myself Looks like it's bait page 42, Bates page 42. It's what it looks like to me. Okay, Mr. Zinzer just putting his just putting his headphones back on. Sorry. It's okay. We have the page number, so we're good. Okay. Uh, and I was asking that same page and the same reference to in future phases was included in the original application materials. And then my question is, did the city's first round of comments in March of 2020 raise any questions or concerns about this page? No, it did not. So the first concern or question or comment you received from the city was in the form of the denial on November 13th, 2020. That's correct. And that basis of denial was on page 16 and 17. If the city had inquired about this, could you have easily clarified why you were including this page and had a discussion with them about it? Yes.
Okay, that concludes my direct examination of Mr. Zinser. Thank you, Mr. Roos. Mr. Raglick, do you wish to cross-examine this witness? Yes, I'll, I'll need a minute to gather some papers, if that's okay, maybe five minutes. Okay, would you like us to actually take a recess for five or just stand by for up to five? Uh, stand by for up to five, if that's okay. Works for me. Thank you. I'm uh, ready to begin. I may have to uh, shuffle some papers at various points, but if you'll bear with me, Mr. Examiner, I can start. Okay. I'm sending an email to somebody, so <laughs> let me press send and then I can pay attention to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. Zinser. I'm Peter Eglick. I'm the one of the attorneys representing the city in this appeal. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions, just some basic questions first. I, I was looking for your firm's website. I, I, I'm not sure. Do you, does your firm have a website? Yes. It's www. And what? Yes, it does. Go ahead. WW. And, and what's the address of it? Because it is done. The address is www. Give, me a, give, me, give, okay. give me a breather before you answer. This is an easy question, but there'll be harder ones. So what is the, the web address for your firm's website? Because I, I, I'm not sure I've got, got it right. Mr. Redlick, and I'm not criticizing Mr. Zinser at all, but it's apparent from the last several hours yesterday and of his testimony today that Mr. Zinzer pauses after the question has been asked before he answers. So you just need to be patient when you ask him a question. The answer will be forthcoming, but don't, if you keep trying to encourage him, it's just going to drag it further out. So, Mr. Zinzer, what's your website for Shook Kelly? Shook Kelly, all one word, www.shookke. L L E Y dot com. Oh, an E Y. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you know if you have anything on your website about your work on, on the Sammamish Town Center? Yes. And do you? Yes. Okay. Um, is, is there anything inaccurate about what I might find on your firm's website about Sammamish Town Center? Inaccurate in what context? Any. It would not correlate with the UZDP submittal that we have. 
And how would it not correlate? I can take a look at it, but if you can tell us, that'd be helpful. Uh, I, objection. I'd like to, if, 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 if there's a particular scheme or diagram that you have in mind, Mr. Edlick, Edlick I'd like to put it on the, in the screen for the, in the interest of clarity. I, I don't, you know, maybe uh, you or Mr. Zinser can call up the, we have the, the address now, so maybe you can call it up. Is this reference, is there an exhibit number that this corresponds to? No, I just asked him and just found out that he's, there's something there that he apparently says it doesn't correlate to the application. I guess I'm going to object if there if it wasn't presented as an exhibit. I'm not sure why we're looking at it in today's testimony. It's not a public record. Well, it's a Mr. Edwin, it's a public what, website. I don't. I, what's sorry. The, what's the relevance to his testimony here yesterday and today under oath? What? Why should I care what's on their corporate website? Well, let me speculate. Suppose that the website shows a plan different than what they've submitted and what they've said has to be done, for example, with regard to townhomes. Still, why do I care? Why do I care what's on their website? Because it, because it impeaches potentially what they've said has to be done with regard to townhomes. I don't know how a graphic representation impeaches anything about his testimony. And I don't know what Can we look at it. I don't know what graphic representation we're talking about. I don't think it's our responsibility to go fetch it up. Well, I can have someone here fetch it up. It'll just take longer. But I, I don't know why it would be a problem to look at what a witness has on his firm's website about this project if he has now said that the representation on the website of, is not consistent with the application submitted to the city. I would argue that this is the kind of thing that should have been identified as an exhibit on the exhibit list. So all parties are notified about it. It, it seems to me oh. that this is going to lead us down a very long and potentially convoluted inquiry if we get the website up who produced it? What role did Mr. Zinser have in producing it, if any, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I could see us sitting here, again, with no criticism of Mr. Zinser, but he is a slow, methodical answerer of questions. We could be here all morning while you ponder the difference between his corporate website and the submissions in this file. And I'm not going to base my decision Mr. on the website. It's not in the record. Presumably Mr. Examiner, it's a public it's a public website. We haven't seen you haven't seen what he has now identified as a difference between the application of the city and what's shown on the website. If Mr. Zinser wants to disclaim it and say he had no role in it, knows nothing about it. Fair enough, um, but it's potentially relevant and impeaching evidence. We don't have to spend an hour on it, but I think it is something, a public website representation of what the project can do, which is apparently what he's saying is different than what the application does, it has got to be relevant. I, it, it, it would be, I think, a, a terrible mistake to foreclose this before we've even spent a minute looking at whatever Mr. Zinser was referring to. I'll let this go for a brief amount of time, but I, I'm dubious as to its value. Uh, I'm concerned about the amount of time that may get spent as we go down this road, uh, I would want to see the website. Uh, if this is something staff considered in its decision, I would agree with Mr. Roos. It should have been submitted as, as evidence. Obviously, somebody in City Hall 
has seen it or you wouldn't be asking questions about it. Um, so I, I, I'm a little concerned at the direction we're going, but I'm going to let it go for a little bit. Um, I do want to see what the heck we're talking about, and I want to find out very quickly what role, if any, Mr. Zinser had in this, whatever it is we're going to look at, um, and, and for what purpose this thing was generated. Well, why don't we start with that before we look at it, if that's okay with you? Works for me. Hey, Mr. Zinser, you said there's something on the website that's different than what was submitted to the city. D did I understand that correctly? That's correct. And what what is on the website uh, uh, about the Sammamish project that's different than what was submitted to the city? Yeah, why is he answering this? There's an early I'm sorry, I didn't hear. The, someone was talking, I couldn't hear whether. He hadn't started to talk yet. There are some. I thought I heard Mr. Ruth. I'm sorry, I thought I heard Mr. Ruth tell him he didn't have to answer this. Did I mishear? That was not me. I'm on mute. Thank you. Someone said that to him. Is there someone in the room with you, Mr. Zinser? Yes, sir. Well, is there someone on the call here who, who told you you didn't have to answer my question? Not that I'm aware of. I didn't hear. Okay. I, I didn't hear. I heard a voice. I didn't hear what the voice said. Uh, I did see one person's light go from red to green, indicating that they had unmuted themselves and then it went back to red again. Now, whether the sound came from that person or not, I don't know. I would prefer not to indicate whose symbol it was. I will say it was not yours. It was not Mr. Roos's. It was not Ms. Koloshkova's. And it was not Ms. Marshall's. I don't know what the person said to him. Let's let him answer the question for Pete's sakes. Fair enough. Go ahead, Mr. Zinser. Can you please repeat the question? What's different? Simply put, what's different? That's what he wants to know. The imagery showing the illustrative concept. Well, let's. Let, can can you be more specific? Or, or I'm gonna I'm gonna object to this without an, without an image in front of us. This is extremely unhelpful and possibly misrepresented. We we have got to have the image in front of us in order for him to testify about the so-called differences. Can you put it up on the screen, Mr. Sugg? Thank you. Did, you've got the address on the website address on. Okay, is that is that uh, one of the images you were referring to, Mr. Zinter? I get, the thing keeps moving. Can you keep it from moving? <laughs> Just gotta love the internet. Okay, and that's the, and how there are two images, Mike. Okay, so let's stay on that one for a minute. So. Mr. Zinser, um, just hitting the highlights, uh, what you said the imagery is different, but it, what specifically is, is different? Are, there, are things located in different places? Yes. Um, and anything located in a different place? than what has been proposed to the city that you've been talking about for the last uh, several hours? Yes. 
Yes, this is an early concept that was produced in 2017. Do you know when the first pre-application uh, discussion was with the city? It was after the production of this image. It wasn't in 2016? Not that I can recall. Okay, well, we can talk about that later. So um, is, is this something that, because uh, the examiner had asked about this, is this something that you had a hand in? Yes. And before we go further and, and lose this, or you move it to some other image, uh, is Mr. Sugg able to take a screenshot of this or whatever it's called, so we can have this as an exhibit? Uh, he's indicating yes. Excellent. I, am I right about that, Mike? Yeah. Okay. So, so, okay, so we're going to make. I'm this, no architect. This is going to be exhibit forty-nine. And if, Mr. Zinter, I'm no architect and no planner, as you'll learn, especially as the morning goes on. But, but it looks to me like in the upper right-hand corner are those the townhomes that we've been talking about since this hearing started. I would need to know specifically where you're pointing. Upper right hand, I, I, I realize this, this is kind of directionally challenged, but um, as I face it, the upper right hand corner of this, this what you called an image, aren't those townhomes? Again, I would need to see a cursor of where you're pointing. Really? Upper right hand corner, yeah, yeah, over there, yes. Thank you. Whoever is doing that, I don't know who is, but thank you. <laughs> Are, now, is, is that the upper right-hand corner to you? I, it doesn't matter, but do, do you see where we're looking at? Yes. Okay, so help me out here. Are those townhomes? There are townhomes in that corner. And, and is that... What, what, is there a block designation, you know, like a numerical block designation for that? No. So you can't tell me what in, on the PCA one, what, what block those are on? Block designations had not been created at the time that this concept was prepared. I think what Mr. Reglick is asking you is, using the block uh, identifiers that are presently in play, can you tell him what block those townhomes are sitting on, block or blocks? They are on block three. And, and, can, and are they on four? No. Okay, and then can we look at the other picture? So looking at this image, What's the difference between this and what was submitted to the city in the application in terms of where things are located? While he's formulating his answer, um, I want to indicate that I'd like this uh, image to also be an exhibit, and we'll make the first one 49A, as in alpha, 
and this will be exhibit 49B as in Bravo. And may I say that I believe, you haven't asked him what direction we're looking at this stuff, I believe we're looking at lower Sammamish Common in the foreground and we're looking northerly on this shot and the other shot I think we were looking towards the southwest. Thank you. I, I think that illustrates the difference between someone expert in cartography and, and a liberal arts major. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Well, I was a liberal arts major too, Mr. Eglick. But <laughs> I thought I, you were an expert in cartography. I am. I got that through a master's, oh. an undergraduate and master's degree in geography. And I was an aerial imagery officer in the Army for three years. So that's how I learned to look at pictures and figure them out. Yeah, I, I never had that fortunate experience of just learning on the fly. Um, can I take a 30-second microphone break, please? Sure. Thank you. I, I had to ask someone who can read images better than I can. So, so looking at, uh, can I go ahead, Mr. Examiner? You may. You may. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Zinser, looking at um, uh, what is now we we've been calling Block Four. Um, that area on this picture what's what's shown there it's a combined block four and block nine development or block eight I should say if we're looking at the corresponding blocks that we have on our current submittal. So what kind of development is shown for block four? What is now block four? Again, it spans between block four and the adjacent block eight. 224th does not extend all the way down. So that is a larger block, which is a combination of what we're saying is block four in the adjacent block eight. And what is shown in that combined block is a mixed use building with commercial on the ground floor and multifamily above wrapping around a shared parking facility. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate your helping me on that. Um, can, can I just ask, and uh, it just looked yesterday as if you might have been reading from from a report or statement when you were giving your testimony? Did you have a particular document you were reading from during your testimony? No, sir. So there's no report or something we don't have or, or outline or something that, that we're not aware of? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, have you ever done uh, any other projects in Washington? No. And when did you first get involved in this project in Washington? By this, I mean the town center project. Two thousand sixteen. And how how were you first involved? How did that come about? We 
started working together with our client, STCA, to begin the planning process for the properties that they had in control at that time. And when was that in 2016? I believe it was in the, the second quarter of that year. And um, when were the images we were just looking at prepared? In 2017, I recall. And uh, can you say when in 2017? I believe it was in the, the third or fourth quarter of that year. Okay. Now, by the time those were prepared, had you been to any meetings with the city? Virtually or otherwise, I don't, you know, I, I, we've got all sorts of different ways of meeting nowadays, but. I believe so, yes. And you recall, and, and I can ask staff if you don't recall, but do you recall when you first uh, had contact with the city of Sammamish staff about this project? I believe it was in 2016. And again, do you recall when? It would have been later in the year. Now, are you aware that there was, I'm sorry, I, I'm really sorry. I didn't realize you weren't done. I believe it was in the third or fourth quarter. Again, I don't have that timeline committed to memory. Did you attend uh, any meetings with the city of Sammamish in the third or fourth quarter of 2016? I'm not sure I would have to check my calendar. And did you take notes when you attended meetings with the city of Sammamish? I took a few personal notes, yes. Uh, do you recall who you met with in the city of Sammamish in 2016? I can't recall. And you mentioned the STCA was your client. Do you have a, a particular client contact at STCA? Yes. Peter Brennan. Who was that? Who are? Peter Brennan. Peter Brennan. So what about Mr. Samwick? Yes. And can you explain to the best of your understanding the relationship or hierarchy, if it was one, between you and Leif Hermanson, who testified yesterday. We are consultants for STCA. And we collaborate on the planning for the project. Are either of you, and is there a hierarchy in which, for example, one of you is makes the final decision for the consultants, or do you have different areas of responsibility? We have different areas, but there's some overlap, and we approach it in a very collaborative manner. If there's and who makes the? I'm sorry, I I going to have to get used to pausing several beats. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Please go. You said please go. 
Oh, okay. I didn't hear that. Uh, who makes the final decision on project questions when a decision has to be made? Is it Mr. Hermanson, for example? Is it you, for example? Or is it, for example, uh, Messrs. Brennan and Samwick? Again, it's a collaborative decision-making process where we inform each other based upon the analysis that we've been creating. So in other words, the client uh, doesn't have the last word. It's kind of a group decision. The client ultimately has the last word, but it's a collaborative discussion for the client to make the evaluation and make the final last word. Were there particular turning points along the way in your work on this project where the client had to choose, let's say, between one option or another, one configuration or another? Configuration of what, please? For example, development on the site. What would be developed where? Yes. As part of the normal planning process, you evaluate different options on the property. And can you recall decisions that came down to a client choice of options? I can't recall, but I know that there were several along the way. It's a very fluid process. And there are different factors that evolve over the course of a project of this magnitude. So they all influence at different points along the way. So. We've had varying uh, testimony as to the acreage on the on the A1 zone. I think today Mr. Roos has been referring to it as the 8.09. Is that 8.09 acres for the A1 zone? It's within the TCA1 zone, correct? Are you are you um, generally talking about the part of it that's south of fourth? I'm sorry, sir, is that question for me? Either one of you, but isn't there a one zone also on the north side of fourth? Yes, sir. And I'm just trying to get in my mind and for the record, is the eight point oh nine that you gentlemen are talking about? Are you referring only to the A1 zone south of fourth that's within the current UZDP application? Yes, sir. And how many of those 8.09 acres are taken up by uh, blocks three and four, Mr. Zinser? The net acreage for those two blocks is approximately 1.85 acres. And that's 1.85 out of apples to apples, 8.09. The 8.09 is the gross acreage for the entire phase one submittal. So what's the, what's the gross acreage for block three and four?
I'd have to look up in my notes for that. I was going to say it's about two. Does that sound about right to you? Again, I have to look at my notes. I can tell you that the gross. You have those handy. He was trying to say. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I guess we'd have to understand the gross acreage as being the center line of the street that's associated with those blocks. I took some notes yesterday and I, and I you know, they could be wrong, but I, were, were you saying that, and please, I apologize if I, if I misunderstood, were you saying that the, the green spine overall is equivalent to central, to the central open space that the city is, is talking about, the central square? Can I just clarify that the city is talking about where, where you say that the city, it's equal to what the city is talking about in, in what document? Anywhere. Central Square. <laughs> Talked about in the decision. Can I don't we, know what the term Central Square means. I was say, can we, can we standardize our terms? There is no such thing as Central Square in any of the documents that I've seen. There is a city square it's not in the town center plan. It's in the town center infrastructure plan. It's where it first pops up, I believe. Correct. So there's the town center, there's the green spine, and there is the city square, which is, I believe, everybody would probably agree is part of the green spine, but it's not all of the green spine. So which, which are you asking him about? Well, I, I think in your explanation, you may have, have kind of defined the terms because what I was asking was whether there, his testimony was that there's a, the green spine itself is the city square just by its own existence. I thought that's kind of what he was saying yesterday, but I think you've question? defined what's what. Do you understand the question, Mr. So, um, Zinser? No, I do not. I'm sorry. He wants to know whether, in your opinion, and correct me if I'm getting this screwed up, Mr. Reglick, he wants to know if, in your opinion, the green square, excuse me, <laughs> I'm doing it, the green <laughs> square is the same thing as the city square. No. The green spine. He said no. So you agree that there is a city square required apart from whatever is required overall that's termed the green spine. Is that correct? Again, I'm confused by the question a little bit. The <laughs> Could you perhaps phrase that a different way? I can try. So is the green spine equivalent to the city square? No. I was uh, trying to follow along yesterday. You were talking about an urban room. Do you recall that? Yes. You showed some images of it. Uh, I think that's in Exhibit 1031. Um, and was the point of your 
testimony that the urban room is, first of all, was the point of your testimony that the urban room is the city square? No. It, because it's not, is it? No. And was the point of your testimony that that urban room that you showed images of was an element of the green spine? Yes. And I couldn't tell from your testimony uh, how that outside area that remember is kind of enclosed by buildings and so on how that uh, operated as a as a public open space is is that the idea that that people would walk into that and and just use it as they would yes there's no gates or any devices that would prohibit the public from walking into that space it's entirely surrounded though isn't it by private development use isn't it not entirely well there are entryways in and out but isn't everything in that it's kind of encloses the space private development use yes and then you also said you referred there's one image where you pointed out where there were balconies on the buildings and that helped to well what 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 were you saying about the balconies what did they do they provide visual connection to the space and from in the space to the building provides animation to the space and from a formal standpoint, it provides articulation of the walls of that room. So when you're talking about the walls of that room and the balconies providing visual connection and so on, for example, are the, are the balconies something that are part of the UZDP application? Please explain what you mean by part of the application. They are components of the building which are submitted as part of the application. So is it your understanding that if the UZDP were approved, then you would have to build the building with the balconies as shown? Balconies would be part of that building design as part of the approved UZDP. I think I asked, a, uh, meant to ask a slightly different question. Is it your understanding that if the UZDP were approved, then the balconies would have to be developed as shown?
I don't believe they would have to be exactly as shown. There would be balconies on those edges that there'd be some flexibility to move balconies as the buildings advanced in design. And and for as, all the other things as, that, I'm sorry, go ahead, I apologize. As shown, there might be some shifting here and there as building goes into advanced design beyond the UCB process. Is there? And for, you still <laughs> Go ahead. These are conceptual illustrations representing that approach to integrating the balconies on those walls. And for all the other features that were shown in those pictures, there were kind of structural things look like maybe walls or pl planter boxes and so on and so forth in that uh, uh, room, as you call it, would those all then be, if the UZDP were approved, they would be developed as in the same fashion as you just said, the balconies would be developed. The plan would be to advance the concepts that are depicted on the ground plane as well, which would include the planter boxes, as well as those elements, those features, the um, the pergolas or the trellises um, in that space. All of the things that you showed as amenities and features of, of the urban room, is that correct? That applies to all of them? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I, I, I have to confess, I, I may, may have forgotten something I asked five minutes ago, but did you, did you say that you attended the pre-application meeting with the city in 2016? I can't recall. I'd have to look at my calendar. Can I ask what pre-application meeting we're talking about specifically? Well, there were, uh, and that's a good clarification, there were a, a number of, of informal, quote unquote, uh, informal uh, pre-app and feasibility meetings, but then there was a formal pre-application meeting that's required by the code, and I believe that was in November 2016. I think we've already had testimony about it, and we have items from the record, in the record from it. So I'm asking whether Mr. Zinser attended that meeting. According to Exhibit 9, the formal pre-app meeting was on May 23rd of 2019. I got my month wrong. The year wrong, too. Does that help, Mr. Zinser? And thank you, Mr. Examiner. Now, I don't think there's anything in the record. I don't recall. And I, I just may be forgetting it in the seven volumes of stuff that I've got here. I don't think there's anything in the record that documents uh, meetings in 2016. There's an MOU dating from 2018 between the city and the applicant. Um, I don't remember anything earlier. If it's there, I don't remember it. And I, I think the, it's my mistake. I had the year and, and the date wrong. There were feasibility meetings starting, I believe, in 2016 after um, well, we'll get into that later, but in any event, yes, I stand corrected. I apologize, and, and uh, I'll ask the question, hopefully, with more accurate information. 
Mr. Zinzer, did you attend the pre-application meeting in 2019? I don't recall. I'd have to check my calendar. You recall, let me ask it this way, do you recall the first time you, you met with the city? I believe it was in 2016. 2016 or 15, I couldn't hear. 16. Okay, and do you recall what that meeting was about? Hang on a minute, Mr. Sensor. Mr. Reglick, according to Exhibit 9, the applicants' representatives at the May 23rd pre-app were Matt Samwick, Bill Pettit, Peter Brennan, Wes Kern, Tim Brockway, Michael Lance, and Cole Wright. That's the city's record from Exhibit 9. So this gentleman was not there unless the city forgot to list him. Fair enough. I think we're back at 2016 now when Mr. Zinser met with the city. And do you recall what that meeting was about, Mr. Mr. Zinser? I recall the first meeting with the city. I can't recall the exact date, but it was an introduction. With myself and Terry Shook to the city in regarding the town center project. And after, what did you do next on the project after that meeting? We began planning activities relative to our clients properties. And the planning activities mean you, you came up with a proposed plan? We came up with a variety of plans. Again, as part of a planning exercise, we explore different options. But that first meeting, and we did not have a plan. It was more of an introduction to receive feedback and understand the context of the town center area. So when did you come up with proposed plans? Can I ask what is meant by proposed plans? Let's say schematics that illustrate various, I'm sorry, should I stop? I was I was just saying, can you clarify the question for the witness? Oh, okay. What was the next step? You said you came up with various options. What? what how do you do that? Is there a? Is, I'm. I have this picture in my mind that you have some sheets, large sheets that have different development configurations on them. Is that a? What happened next? Yes, we prepare uh, different schemes and options for the properties based upon the conditions at the time. And what what did you do with those? We discussed those internally with the ownership team and consultant team. And did all of those uh, schemes and options show townhomes on blocks three and four? Not all of them. Some of those schemes and options show mixed use development on blocks three and four.
on block four, again, with a combination of block eight and other considerations at the time, did show a mixed use building in that combined block structure. You're saying that was one option showed that, is that correct? As part of our internal planning, yes. Were there any other options shown for blocks three and four that did not entail townhomes on blocks three and four? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Were there any other options that did not show townhomes on blocks three and four? I can't recall. What did happen next with regard to those options that you said were prepared? Again, these options were prepared internally to advance discussions internally about the approach to development on the site. which led us to the ultimate pre-application submittal. So the next thing that happened after the options were prepared is that you made a pre-application submittal. Is that your testimony? A pre-application was prepared after internal planning exercises, which evaluated different configurations. I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the word after you, the word internal. What was the word after that? Internal considerations of the, the various planning exercises that we did. Oh, exercise. Okay. Um, was there a decision made to proceed with one of the options of the ones that had been prepared as the pre-application submittal? Yes. How was that decision made? That was made collaboratively looking at the options and the conditions at time for the owner to ultimately say, this is the plan we'd like to submit. So there was a, ultimately an owner decision. Is that what I understand you're testifying to? Yes. Okay. Um, when did you, if you can recall, next meet with the city about the development proposal? Just to, just to clarify, is this next speak with the development after which date? After the, after the pre-application meeting in May of 2019? No, after his meeting and I believe now, I, where are we in the time? I'm sure I'm going to be corrected on this, but I, I think he said he had met in 
2016, was it? Oh. So you're so you're well, you are we going back? Because we advanced, we advanced, we advanced to the pre-application. Are we going back now to 2016? We're going back to what was the next meeting with the city after that? When was it? After the first meeting we had, or after yeah. the application yeah. in 2019? I think he's asking after, after the first the, meeting. After the first get to meet your meeting. I can't recall. I'd have to look at my calendar. How did you prepare for your testimony in this hearing? I reviewed the state, the city staff report for particular items that I talked about yesterday and today. Did you review your notes? Yes. And did you review the exhibits for the, for this hearing that had been pre-filed? Yes. And I don't just mean the ones pre-filed by STCA. I mean, ones pre-filed by city STCA, both. I reviewed the exhibits that were associated with the work that we were responsible for. Okay, C could you take a look at, man, I get lost in these notebooks. I think it's exhibit eight. Looking at it now. Let me know when you've got it. Pardon me? I have it now. He says he has it. Oh, terrific. So, exhibit eight is two pages. You probably want to look at the second page, which is all of one big line, um, or I guess it's three pages, but the second page is all of one big line. That's that's you, right? As it having it listed as having uh, attended the meeting. Exhibit eight. Are you on page one? Page. Let's see. Um, I think it's page two of exhibit eight. My page two of exhibit A is an email correspondence. Oh boy. Um. Well, let me make a ruling. <laughs> According to the copy of exhibit eight that was provided to me, the page stamp, page stamp page two has Mr. Vincer's name at the top of it as an attendee at that meeting. 
which was held on August 9th, 2018, along with Mr. Shook and Mr. Brennan. And uh, Paul Fusel from KPG, the other attendees were City of Sammamish folks. So you were apparently there, sir. Try not to spend a lot of time just looking for his name on a line on a piece of paper. I think he was there. Let's it, ask I him have, the meeting if you want to ask him something. I, I do. I just wanted to wait till he, he was ready. Um, if you could look on the first page of Exhibit A, which I hope we track on that, <laughs> I can always hope. Um, do you see where it says agenda and then item two on agenda topics? It, do you see where it says Green Spine User Guide and Companion Manual? Do you see that, Mr. Zinser? I do, and I apologize and step back. Um, these pages are printed um, on both sides, and I, I, yeah, I see my name on that second page. Okay, so you see 2A on uh, discussion topics on the first page? Yes. And I'm just, did you review the Green Spine User Guide and Companion Manual for that meeting? From what I recall, we did not have that guide at that meeting. Okay, let's, let's, we won't debate that. Have you reviewed it since that meeting? Yes. And I've got a zillion pages of notes here, but so I'm, I'm gonna ask you rather than go through them all, but did you mention the Green Spine User Guide and Companion Manual in any of your testimony uh, so far? No. Would this be a reasonable time for our mid-morning break? It'd be a wonderful time for a break. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, my computer clock says it is 1040. We are at recess until 1050 a.m. Mr. Exhibitor? Okay, we're not at recess. Mr. Eglick? Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm just asking for an extended recess to 15 instead of 10 um if it's at all possible we are at recess from 10 41 to 10 56. much appreciated thank you this conference will now be recorded thank you and welcome back everybody it is now 10 57 a.m on july 13 2021. This is the start of session seven in the appeal hearing of UZDP 2019-00562. We continue with Mr. Eglick's cross-examination of Mr. Zinser. Mr. Zinser, I remind you again that you're still under oath. Proceed, Mr. Eglick. Thank you. Move this one over here. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm wrestling notebooks here, but Mr. 
Zinser, could you look at um, Exhibit 8, please? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. It's my tab eight in my notebook. It's not an exhibit number. I apologize for that. Can you look at uh, 21B30? O three O. Or O four O. Sorry. And, and let me know when you have that handy, please. What's the what is the exhibit number again? I have a twenty. I have an exhibit twenty one, but it's only one page. He's giving him a code no, record, the co not an exhibit. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Code section twenty one Bravo dot thirty dot zero four zero. Okay. And uh, sub two, I think it's the one that was discussed yesterday. By Mr. Zinzer. Okay. Am I permitted to pull that up off the website? Sure. Sure. Well, up to the examiner, but fine by me. I'm sorry, that was a yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'm looking at 21B.30.040. Sub two. B. That's Rain Orange Streets? Yes. And could I ask you, I think Mr. Bruce had you read some code sections yesterday, maybe even this one, but could you read again the the um, first sentence in sub B after the words pedestrian oriented streets? PC A1, A2, and A3 zoned areas shall include designated pedestrian oriented street segment as determined by the city through the unified zone development planning process. And would it be fair to say that you disagree with what the city conveyed as to what street segments should be designated as pedestrian oriented?
I think we had questions. I'm sorry, I thought the point wasn't it of your testimony yesterday that you disagreed with the city requiring that all the street segments be pedestrian oriented? Yes, we did disagree, but but we had questions about that. And was the question that you didn't understand that the city was requiring that, that all street segments be pedestrian oriented? Yes. So in, in other words, it wasn't that you knew what the city wanted and didn't want to do it, didn't agree with it, it was that you didn't know what the city wanted. Is that your testimony? No, we disagree with the statement that all pedestrian, all streets needed to be pedestrian oriented. Okay. Any question. Why some of those streets could not be mixed use. But you didn't have any doubt, did you, as to what the city was saying it wanted to see in the proposed project? Let me object. I, I think we need to be precise about at what point in time we're talking, given that impressions may have changed over time, depending on what was heard from the city. Well, if the witness can express that if in fact, uh, his understanding and opinions did change over time. I'm sure he's capable of explaining to us that he had one opinion at one time and another at another. So to the extent, I guess that it calls for a ruling, I, I guess I'm uh, overruling the objection. With the pre-application, we had not designated streets. The comments we received from the city stated that the TCA1 shall include designated street segment. So with our first submittal, November 4th, 2019, we included segments of pedestrian orange streets along with mixed use streets. The comments. Let's after go back if we. I'm sorry. The comments after that submittal stated that all streets must be pedestrian oriented. And that's what we disagreed based upon our reading of the code. Let's go back to exhibit nine, if you would, Bates page four, subsection 2C, which is language that you interpreted yesterday with Mr. Roos. Is that page four, section 2C? I'm looking at it? Yes. Now, when you just paraphrased it, Mr. Zinser, I noticed you left out the word entirely. Is 
Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And I think your testimony yesterday was that you thought that what was said in 2C meant you had to have some pedestrian oriented segments, but not all. Is that correct? That's correct. The streets in the TCA1 zone must include entirely pedestrian oriented segments. So is there we, such a thing as we, a, I'm sorry, go ahead. We included pedestrian oriented segments. We included streets, segments of streets that were entirely pedestrian oriented. Let's go over again your understanding of what a segment means. Can you give us that? It's a length of a street, a portion of a street. Have you ever seen a circumstance in which a segment of a street is split into two designations, or would that just be two segments? portion of a street. Please repeat that. I'm sorry. Have you ever seen a circumstance in which a segment of a street is split into two portions, two designations, or would that just be two segments? A segment of a street split into two segments? I, I'm afraid I just, I don't understand. The question. If we have- Have you ever seen, I'm sorry, go ahead. So we're talking about a length of street from A to B, a point, if we just define a point between that A to B, between that point to B would be a segment, and from that point to A would be a segment of that street. But didn't you read this section as suggesting that segments could be split in their designations? Yes. Okay. And would you agree that a synonym for entirely is all, A-L-L? -L?
I don't think I could say that definitively without looking at a dictionary. Well, we'll move on because we can all look at a dictionary later. Could you look at Bates page 10 of that same exhibit? Section 1B. Yes, I'm looking. Could you read the first sentence in section 1B? The town center plan identifies the street network within the TCA1 zone, Southeast 4th Street, Southeast 6th Street, Street A, 22nd place southeast, 224th place southeast, and 225th place southeast as pedestrian oriented streets and corridors, including park edges for design review. Alvin. The section we were reading before, I think you mentioned in your testimony yesterday. I don't think you mentioned this section. Is it your testimony that this section isn't relevant to understanding what the city was trying to convey about pedestrian oriented streets? Is there a question uh, on the floor? I sure thought there was. Would you refresh my memory what it is? I, I asked the witness whether it was his testimony that the, I pointed out as to what he had testified yesterday about the first section I brought to his attention and asked him whether it was his testimony that the second section that I brought to his attention today was not relevant to his understanding of the first. It is, but we looked at that in context with the reference. To the TCIP. And that's what caused some confusion because the TCIP, as we talked yesterday,
correlates with two street typologies. Okay, um, so your testimony is still that you were confused about what the city intended in light of, still in light of that second comment I've had you look at from the city. Is that correct? At this point in time, at the time that these comments were put together, there's some ambiguity relative to these references. And when did that ambiguity, if ever, get clarified for you? I don't think it has been clarified for me. I want to be clear on this. Are you saying there's ambiguity because you disagree with the city's interpretation? Or again, are you saying there was ambiguity because you didn't understand, for example, with regard to the phrase about entirely pedestrian oriented segments, you didn't understand what the city intended. I don't think I understood what the city intended based upon the references they made to the TCIP. And is it your testimony that you were still confused in June when the city issued, when the, excuse me, in June when you made the final submittal to the city? We were confused that with those comments after the first submittal, the city stated that all streets need to be pedestrian oriented in their typology. That was the first time that we had that mandate for all streets. And you're referring now to what?
it would be exhibit 20. which is the plan review summary for STCA's Southwest Quadrant Town Center development proposal and the companion matrix. On page five. Exhibit 20 has many parts. Which one are you talking about? 20G, 20H? Sorry, it's, it's uh, 20A. 20A, okay. I'm sorry. Well, it's both 20 and 20A. I was initially going to the um, to the matrix, but on 20 page one, street typology, the first sentence: all streets or segments of streets within the TCA one zone are required to be pedestrian oriented pursuant to 21B30. 0401B. Can you look at, uh, as long as we're in exhibit 20, Look at D, page one. If, if I could just make an observation, the code section that he just read, and he read it accurately from the document, is wrong. Because it says 040 sub 1B, and 040 sub 1B is about limiting the placement of buildings or other development features that inhibit the desired connectivity of the town center circulation network. I think the code section meant to be. So there's a typo in the letter. In my opinion. For whatever it's not worth. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possible that it's a typo. Anyway, could we look at uh, 20 D, eight page one? Which item on the page do you want him to look at? Six and seven. Six and seven, thank you. Okay, I'm looking. So the last set of comments we looked at, I think was from May of 2019, and these are March of 2020. So we're almost a year later. And the city has asked in six, for a revision to make all streets and segments of streets within the TCA one zone pedestrian oriented. Do you see that in six? Yes. And then when the revision was submitted, that was in June, right? Correct. And before the revision was submitted, there was further meeting with the city, correct?
Correct. And it's not your testimony, is it, that the city in the further meeting said, oh, you're right, the streets don't have to be designated pedestrian. That's not your testimony, is it? No. But the submission that was made to the city didn't revise as the city had requested, did it? It did. If we look at comment number seven, Streets in the TCA1 are required to include entirely pedestrian oriented segments referred to the town center infrastructure plan. The town center infrastructure plan provides a correlation for two street typologies. So our submittal included pedestrian oriented streets on all streets with the exception of the four segments that we discussed yesterday. And is it your testimony that it was your understanding after the May 2019 comments, after the March 2020 comments, after the meetings with the city, that that was acceptable to the city, consistent with the city's determination of how the streets should be designated? Is that your testimony? Or is your testimony that it should have been acceptable to the city? My, my, based upon the comments of six and seven and the rationale we provided, We believe, or I believe, we are in compliance with the intent of the infrastructure plan as a key reference. That's not exactly what I asked, so I'll try maybe to be clear, and I apologize for not being clear. I understand your testimony is that you take the position that what you submitted was in compliance with what you've called the key reference. What I'm asking is a different question. Was it your understanding that what you submitted was consistent with the city's determination about designation of pedestrian streets in the A1 zone and for the project area. No, in that the city was requesting that all streets be pedestrian oriented. Okay, thank you.
just I, I want to try to understand a little bit more about um, your understanding of planning for the city square. Is the UZDP application that the city reviewed, does the UZDP application that the city reviewed include a, as part of the application, a location for the city square? For which submittal? For the one that the city denied. The application shows a city square location on the north side of Southeast 4th Street that is not part of the phase one project area. So, I'm sorry, were, I just better make sure, were you done? Yes. Oh, thank you. So the application, if approved, would leave undecided the location of the city square as far as SDCA is concerned? The application envisioned the city square on the north side of Southeast 4th Street. And there was applicant response such that we would continue discussions with the city based upon that location. And were you part of whatever discussions occurred about the city square with the city? Yes. As part of those discussions, did STCA make any demands from the city? For which city square are we talking about? Any of them. Not that I'm aware of. You're not aware of any demands by STCA from the city in connection with city square in any of the locations that were discussed. Is that your testimony? I'm not aware of any demands. Are you aware of anything that you would characterize as not a demand, but as a, let's call it a request, an ask, a precondition, any of those? Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, is this, is this at any point, is this a question about at any point in time? Just going to try to clarify that. We'll start with that. Uh, so again, repeat the question, please. Whether it's called the demand and ask a request, I don't want to get hung up on the or precondition. I don't want to get hung up on the definition. What did STCA ask for from the city in return for creation of a city square at any of the locations that were discussed? I'm not aware of any asks of that nature. 
What do you mean by that nature? A demand or a, a request? You weren't present when, for example, were demands made financial contribution? That was discussed, but I don't believe it was a demand. Were there any other, we'll get back to that in a minute, but were there any other, let's call them, so we don't get hung up on definitions, were there any other discussion points, prerequisites, preconditions, made by SDCA in connection with the city square. Not that I can recall. If I change the wording from discussion point to some other word, would it make a difference in your answer? I don't know. <laughs> so what do you recall, and, and I can ask city people about this, but what do you recall as one of the um, leaders of the STCA team as to the discussion point about financial contribution to City Square by the city? My recollection was in reference to the TCIP and some of the opening paragraphs within that document, which outlines the opportunity, I'm paraphrasing here, for the city to make contributions to significant components of the project. Now, just for the record, could you clarify when you said, I think, CPIP, what that is? PCIP is the Town Center Infrastructure Plan. Oh, I thought you said CPIP, C is in Charlie, so I thought it was some other thing I was not aware of. Okay, sorry. you're talking about T is in Tom, CIP. I'm sorry, yes. And what's your recollection of the discussion about what you're saying is a reference in the TCIP? What, what, what did SDCA ask for? I don't recall asking for anything. Why was the reference to the TCIP made in discussions then? What was its purpose? I think it was to show the opportunity for where those contributions could possibly be made.
but there was not an ask for a contribution. Let me ask you a question about the, these roundabouts that uh, you spent quite a bit of time talking about yesterday. Um, do you know when those were designed? I believe the design process started in about 2015. Was that one, one five? Yes. And when were they built? I think construction completed um, earlier this year. When did STCA acquire the property that's the subject of the UZDP that we're talking about? I don't know. You don't know whether it's before or after the roundabouts were designed? I don't know. Is it your testimony, Mr. Zinser, that mixed use development isn't possible on blocks three and four? Can we, can we um, define the term? Can we, uh, objection as to vagueness, can we define the term mixed use development? mixed use development as used in the code. That's a good enough clarification for me. It is possible. And yesterday, when you were talking about the townhomes that have been proposed for blocks three and four, I was struck by, at one point, you used the term lush. Do you recall that? Yes. And I, I was trying to figure out what you meant by that and with reference to what. To the streetscape. Can you explain? I'm sorry. I just 
was going to actually ask a question and say, can you explain? Yes, it's in regards to the streetscape and landscape it would occur within that 30 foot setback. It's an adjective to describe the image that would be in that zone, which would include components of landscaping, hardscaping, decorative fences, rails. That would be a, a very lush pedestrian amenity along that frontage. So, I'm trying to picture this. Those townhomes are, are they'd be private, wouldn't they? Yes. And they're not uh uses that are open to and invite the public are they public would be able to access if I was visiting somebody in the townhome I could walk through that front garden and visit my neighbor but it would be privately maintained as part of the landscape and hardscape for that particular unit. And and I think the illustrations that that I think I've seen show it's it's fenced off, isn't it? There's decorative railings that define that frontage. It would not be continuous, but there are gates into each of those front garden spaces. And the garden spaces are maintained by the private property owners, is that correct? Correct. It's outside and of the public right of however, way. However they choose to maintain it, isn't that correct? That's correct. Are you aware of any studies that were done about the market feasibility of mixed use development on blocks three and four? Specific market feasibilities for those two blocks have not been conducted. Are you aware of any studies that have been conducted concerning market feasibility of townhomes on blocks three and four? I'm not aware of specific market studies. So is the position that you took yesterday and today and your testimony isn't relying on market studies, is it? Oh, it's relying on market experience relative to commercial activities and patterns. And that's market experience in the Pacific Northwest, is it? No. 
You also testified, I thought yesterday, about the location of wetlands in relation to blocks three and four. Do you recall that? Yes. And I, I have to confess, I was having trouble keeping up. You, you testify nice and uh, deliberately, but still you were making a lot of points and I don't think I caught them all. Can you explain again what the wetlands presence has to do with whether or not there could be mixed use development on block three and four? It's a factor that diminishes the viability of commercial on that block. Because with the shift of the roundabout, that property on the other side of Southeast 4th Street is pinched into a wedge such that development across the street is challenged without getting into some encroachments into the buffer or buffer averaging and so on. So we lose the ability to have a more intense commercial activity that would make block three more commercially viable. It would, it would diminish the commercial viability by not having that adjacent commercial activity on the opposite side of Southeast Forest. Could you, the, the last sentence you said, could you repeat that last sentence, please? I think I didn't catch it. Without the ability to have commercial on the north side of Southeast 4th Street, opposite, opposite to Block 3, it diminishes the commercial viability of the Block 3 as a commercial use. And, and is that a, is that a, a, a commercial marketing opinion? Would say it's an opinion based upon my experience with other commercial projects. So are you typically involved in the marketing aspect of other commercial projects? On other commercial mixed use projects, I have worked with leasing agents and with developers on the front end in terms of locating commercial uses relative to the factors in place at the time of development. And, and go ahead. One of the factors in terms of creating these mixed use environments is to have compact and correlating commercial activities. When that is eroded, it diminishes the commercial viability.
And I think we're, we've been full circle again. What leasing agent did you work with in coming to the opinion that you just expressed here? I have not worked with a commercial leasing agent. For this particular circumstance. And I think you've already said there's, there, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I stepped on your lines. Finish, please. I have not worked with a commercial leasing agent relative to that condition. And I think we've already established you don't you don't have any marketing analysis either with regard to this project, correct? I have not been a part of the marketing analysis for the project. I guess I should have asked the question differently. Does STCA, to your knowledge, have marketing analysis for the project? know if I could answer that definitively. I'm asking about your knowledge. Can you answer definitively about your knowledge? Yes. So then please answer the question. I believe there has been market analysis on the site and the project. And what do you base that belief on? Conversations with the owner. Have you seen any market analysis yourself? Yes. <sighs> what have you seen? I've seen an early analysis prior to the submittal. I guess I'm kind of confused. By the way, are you, were you done? I'm sorry. Yes. 
I guess I'm kind of confused because I thought at first you said you didn't know of any market analysis, but you were then aware of some from conversation with the owner. Then it turns out you've seen a market analysis. So I, I, I must be asking the wrong questions, but I'll try to do better. I apologize. Um, I, I, my confusion stems from points in time and aspects of the project we're talking about. My first response was relative to the UZDP submittal that we're talking about, the phase one project. I'm not aware of any market analysis for that specific portion of the project. Are you aware of any market analysis that includes inter alia that portion of the project? Yes, it would encompass that area of the project. And who performed the market analysis that you are aware of? Robert Gibbs. Can you spell that, please? R O B E R T G I B B S. Does that market analysis address at all the relative market for townhomes? I can't recall. Does the market analysis address at all the issue that we've just discussed about, and I don't mean specifically identifying it in that way, but discuss at all the factors that we discussed that are results you have said from the wetland? It was not that detailed analysis relative to that particular component. Do you know when the market analysis that you are aware of, I assume there's, there's only one, is there more than one that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. You know when it was performed? I believe it was in 2016 or early 17. Again, I can't recall. Another thing I, I kind of made notes about, and I want to kind of clarify with you, and I will clarify it with staff as well, or try to, but there's this concept of the wedding cake. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And is the wedding cake concept something that in your approach applies internally within the project area in the A1 zone? Or is the idea that the A1 zone is uh, the top of the cake and then the other zones are the downward layers? Do you see what I mean? I do. So is it, is, is the, 
is the wedding cake, it's the happy couple at top and maybe the cake underneath them and then that's A1 zone and then the, the rest is as the cake layers down or, or are, is it your uh, conception that you also layer down within the A1 zone? I think you lay down in the A1 zone relative to compatibility to the adjacent context. The geometry of that A1 zone lends itself to an asymmetric cake. So then it, just to clarify, so it's your testimony that the A1 zone is supposed to be asymmetric and, and incorporate on some aspects um, stepping down. Is that right? Yes. And then I think your testimony was, wasn't it, that the townhomes on three and four kind of uh, foster that stepping down? Yes. And is, is that because they're townhomes or is that because of of their height? Because of their, because of their height. And, and how high are you projecting for the townhomes on three and four? Along 224th, we're projecting a three and a half story. It'd be a, a three story with an occupied roof. And that puts us at about 55 feet. And then we step down on the backside facing the TCB zone with a three story proper townhome. So we're using the grade as well as the building height to make that transition with a townhome typology. So I'm just a land use lawyer. I don't. I'm not an architect, so and uh, so I, or a planner. We got planners here. They'll probably speak to this, but I, I just got to ask: Why can't a mixed use development do that too? It could, but as we discussed yesterday, there's factors that make it complicated and challenging to do that in a compatible way in that narrow strip of land. Mr. Reglick, do you have um, a significant amount of additional questions likely? Um, yes, sir. I'm, I'm on page 17 of my notes and my notes go through page um, 24. <laughs> I think so that'll we'll take, take me a while. I think we'll take lunch. Um, it is 12, 16 p.m. We stand at recess until 1.16 p.m. Thank you.
<clears throat> this conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everybody. It is now 1.17 p.m. on July 13, 2021. This is session eight in the appeal hearing for UZDP 2019-00562. Mr. Eglick, you may continue your cross-examination questioning of Mr. Zinser. And Mr. Zinser, I remind you, you're still under oath. Mr. Eglick. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Zinser, we were talking about the wetland uh, and its relation to uh, blocks three and four before the break, uh, break. Do you recall that? Yes. Do you have anything uh, that you can, I think you were using an exhibit yesterday, but I didn't catch the number that shows the wetland in juxtaposition to block three and four? Sure. sure. I believe I believe his testimony is accompanied by exhibit 1031, 1031. page eight yesterday. Uh, Mr. Redlick, are you going to want him to share that along with him? Uh, please. Or I could have it done here, if, if whatever is easiest. We have to ask Mr. Sugg to, okay, there it is. What's about how it got there? I'm showing it on my side. I'm showing it on my side. I'm hearing an echo. I'm hearing an echo. There's a terrible echo. It's coming from the city hall. It's coming from the city hall. Um, should I turn off my mic and turn it on again? Would that help? There's a, whatever you've done back there has fixed it. <clears throat> Well, it's we we the mics were swapped out during the lunch break. Uh, I guess because they need batteries or something. So this is a new mic. When you said it was fixed, I had turned it off for a minute. Now I've turned it back on. Has that helped? Well, the question is, am I getting an echo? Am I getting an echo? See, there's a lag between when you're in your. Uh, Speakers uh, that can be hall. So if you could somehow turn that volume down, I think that volume down, it's going to drive us all nuts. Do that, Mike. We're we're having echo. We we have help. Check 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 check. It, it's not really <clears throat> an echo so much as it is a lag. Your speakers there are putting out the sound about three seconds after I say it. And then that means we're just sort of stumbling over each other with our voices. Let me say I've heard I it a little I'm, bit. I've heard it a little bit in the background before, but never this loud and never this pronounced. Is it any better with this mic? Well, the question is. No, see, it's not your mic. It's the speakers down there are loud enough that they're picking up on your mic. And then I don't know about the other people. Mr. Roos, what's it like for you? Yeah, I'm getting the same pronounced echo or okay. lag. <clears throat> We've got two people here trying to figure out what's going on. Well, why don't we give it a try? But then how do we hear him? Uh, how do we hear him? 
Well, no, I didn't hear a big lag on the last thing I said. And I don't hear one this time. Maybe, because, maybe yeah, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds uh, sounded a little better. And now I'm hearing myself. Yeah, it was good for a second or two there. <laughs> Um, why don't you give it a try? Okay, now see, I don't hear the the echo back. <clears throat> check, check, check on my side. I don't hear an echo. Um, what I have been asked to do is which I have been doing anyway, I thought, is keeping my mic off except when I'm talking and maybe that will help, although I don't think that was the issue, but, but we'll try that. Why don't you go ahead and let's see how it goes. Okay. <clears throat> um, looking at the exhibit, I guess it's from 10, is it 1031? Uh, it, it was Bates 8, I think. Yes. Oh, well, here it says. Yes. So can you use that uh, cursor to point out where the wetland is? The darker green. Darker green. And, and that's the wetland you're talking about? Yes. And the buffer area is the lighter shade and I'm getting a, a feedback. Say something else, Mr. The wetlands north of Southeast 4th Street. There's no echo on that. <clears throat> and I didn't hear an echo for my words either. So I don't know what you've done, but if you can keep whatever that is, that works. Okay, let's let Mr. Zinzer go ahead and try and complete his answer. Okay. Thank you, sir. The, uh, the wetland is described in the solid green line in this area with the patterning over the dark green. The associated buffer is the lighter green defined by the blue dash line. I can blow that up. And where did the data from this schematic come? Or the wetland where, definition? Yeah, where where did the, the 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 data come showing the the wetland, the boundaries, the buffer? That came from our consultant team. Came from our consultant team. And do you know what the uh, regulatory status is of the wetland? It's a classified Corps of Engineer wetland. I wonder if you know anything more than that, for example, from city files or anything. I believe the wetland is depicted on a few city documents, a few of the, the concept plans that are within the town center plan. I believe it's also indicated on the um, TCIP concept plans.
And could you just show again where you're saying the buffers result in, in a, I forget the word used, was it tightness or crowding or whatever the word was you were using? Yes, as the, as the, the wetland border angles toward, I'm getting that reverb. <clears throat> Go ahead, Mr. Zenzer. He's turned off his mic. Okay. <clears throat> At least so I that think that's what he did. Okay. That pinch occurs relative to the expected continuation of 224th Street to the north. If you imagine a datum following this line of that right-of-way extending north, the developable land area between that right-of-way and the wetland is pinched into a wedge. I'm sorry, does that answer the question? Are you saying it's affecting development south of north or fourth of north? It has a direct impact on the north impact. and an indirect impact on the south. And, and what, again, is the direct impact north? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to object here as to be, it being asked and answered. I feel like we've gone over this two or three times now, and this is in addition to testimony on this issue before the break. This is going on quite a long time. He is right. It's been gone over several times. Why do we need to do it again? <clears throat> well, I guess I could just say I'm, I'm not understanding the explanation as to what the impact is, and I'm hoping for more information. Well, yesterday, yesterday he gave a, a very detailed explanation of what I would call his perception of the need for synergy across the street at that corner and how you couldn't get it because you couldn't get any commercial frontage on 4th in the northwest quadrant of 224th and 4th. I, I don't know what more you want him to say. That's what he said yesterday. <clears throat> I, I, and I, perhaps that's the the answer, um, or at least a, the answer uh, from the examiner's explanation, perhaps that's the answer. I was just trying to understand if there's, if, if the, the point is north of fourth that can't be developed. Um, if there's something more than the, I, I guess, what seems kind of apparent is you have a wetland so you can't develop there um is that is that the point fourth of fourth Are you going to answer, Mr. Then I actually have a question. So the question again is what what is the point? I'm sorry. He's not he's not he's remembering not is the best way to say it. Your testimony yesterday about how the lack of commercial frontage on fourth 
in the northwest quadrant of 224th and 4th affects the desirability of putting mixed-use commercial in the southwest corner quadrant um, at, at the northeast corner of block three. So I think he's basically asking you to repeat what you said yesterday about the synergy at you. And synergy, I think, is my word, not yours. Effectively, we lose one corner of commercial activity at this intersection. Any development that occurs in this wedge is complicated by the geometry of that wedge. Had the roundabout been located in its original location for the TCIP, we would have had more frontage along Southeast 4th Street at that intersection, as well as a larger block to create that co-relationship of commercial activity on four corners of the intersection. So the loss. And then, the then I'm, I'm the, sorry, are you done? The shift of the street to the west pinches that frontage to a wedge and reduces the width of block three. And I can't tell from the schematic here, but is it also your testimony that the the buffer of the wetland has a direct impact on the development of lot three? I'm going to I'm going to object. I'm going to renew yeah, my objection. Gonna, this is again continuing that. over and over the same ground that's been covered. Objection sustained. Well, I, th I think, Mr. Examiner, if I may respond to the objection before the ruling or after, um, after. it's a little bit different question that, that's been, that has been asked before and his, directly relates to the buffer and his, the outlines his, on the schematic. His explanation yesterday, I believe, clearly set forth his argument. Um, I don't need to hear more about it. Turning to another part of your testimony, I think was yesterday as well. Did you testify that the city asked SDCA to move townhomes from block eight, where they had been proposed by SDCA to blocks three and four? I don't recall if I mentioned that as part of my testimony.
Keep going. Oh, is that the end of your answer? Is that the end of your answer? So the townhomes were moved from block eight on STCA's own accord, not in response to a city request. Is that correct? Let, let me note while he comes up for his answer, I don't believe there has been test that townhomes were ever proposed and asked or told to be moved by anybody. So that's fact and evidence. Now maybe one my of my notes are fallible. My notes are fallible, but they say that this witness testified we moved townhomes from block eight per city request. Okay, I missed that then. I apologize. Well, I could be wrong. <laughs> so, Mr. Zenzer, his question to you is, is it your testimony that the city asked or told STCA to move townhomes from block eight to blocks three and four. That was certainly not his, uh, uh, Mr. Zinzer can testify. I, I, I think it's Mr. Yush, you can't testify for him. That's not my recollection. Again, my, my notes can be fallible, but I have notes that say that there were two adjustments made to townhomes by STCA in its proposal and that it withdrew townhomes from block eight. So let's stop there. Is that correct? That is correct. And townhomes were then located on blocks three and four, is that correct? That mischaracterizes the witness's testimony. Well, I, I asked him a question and asked whether it's correct. I, I'm not sure the attorney needs to tell him how to answer. The attorney shouldn't tell him how to answer. The townhomes remained on block three and four in a different configuration. Now I'm confused. Um, With the uh, November 4th, 2019 submittal. The townhomes were removed from what we're calling block eight. And 224th Street had a different alignment than, than what we're seeing right now. We actually chicaned it to the west. And instead of one east-west street, southeast fifth street, there were two east-west streets. So Pardon me for interjecting, Mr. Reglick, but I'm still trying to track where you folks are. 
you said that on uh, Mr. Zinzer, you said on the November 4, 2019 submittal, townhomes were moved from Block 8. There, that was the first submittal, wasn't it? That was the first submittal. After so the there was never an application submitted that had them on Block 8, is that right? That's correct. Had they been, what, discussed? At, at, were they in the pre-app phase consideration? They were in the pre-app consideration. And in the pre-app version, what was in blocks three and four? Townhomes. Did... So townhomes. There, was, there were townhomes there. Yes, sir. So there were townhomes in three, four, and eight in the pre-app version. Is that right? That's correct. And then when the application was filed in November, eight was taken out of the proposal and the town home stayed in three and four. That's correct. The alignment of 224 was chicaned with that first submittal you mean the preliminary, the pre the No, this was the first submittal. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. And with that chicane, instead of the east, just the single east-west southeast 5th Street, we had two east-west streets. Okay. Your turn, Mr. Edlick. Thank you, Ola. You were doing fine. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm not sure that it gets to the question. Yeah, this uh, this is the worst that I've heard this offset echo thing coming out of City Hall. If we have to put up with this for the next five days, I think we're all going to go nuts. It's not an echo, it's just a lag, about a three second lag. And everything I say, Mr. Zinser says, Mr. Roos says, is we're picking it up, I guess, out of one of your mics there in City Hall, but it's about three or four seconds after we've said it. So it starts hanging up on top of everybody else. I, I know you're not the techie. I wouldn't know what to do if I were there either, other than look at somebody and say, fix it. But <laughs> um, I, yeah, I'm still back in the era where tube TVs and you kind of slap the side of the TV and hope the tube works again. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> that really used to happen. Um, apparently, uh, well, please uh, hold on a second. One of the IT people is here. Um, I hope I don't get shot for the suggestion, but I just talked to the IT person and he said it could be an issue with the carrier or with GoToMeeting and that one possible solution is for everyone to log out and log back in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just the messenger. I... I wish I knew whether this lag, <clears throat> whether this lag was getting picked up in the recording. Um, if it's getting picked up in the recording, then I'm really concerned about somebody's ability to really understand what folks are saying. If it's not getting picked up in the recording, 
then it's probably it's just a problem for us trying to listen through it. Um, and there's probably no way to know that without everybody logging out and having Mr. Sugg listen to a chunk of the recording. I, I don't know whether I want to go that route or not. Is the is the is the problem uh, addressed if the city hall line is put on is mute is muted? Well, that seems to be what Mr. Reglick has been doing on the occasions when we haven't had that that lag. Because I I watch him lean over, and I think you're sitting at, on the stage left end of the dais, aren't you? Um, there's actually a horseshoe. Of tables here, and I'm sitting on the on the as to my right hand on one of the horseshoe tables, and there is one speaker for this room because uh, we've got, for example, uh, Mr. Whited and the city attorney Lisa Marshall here, um, and that's why there is a, a there's a common speaker for this room because otherwise we'd have a cacophony of of uh, speakers from the laptops. Um, the the person who knows how to deal with this technology has said that the uh, the feed that's being recorded, as far as he can tell, does not have uh, an echo on it or or any sort of distortion like that. So maybe that's good news. Um, okay. Let's try it. I I think the key thing is for you to mute yourself as soon as you finish saying something. I know that's a lot to ask of you because you're you're thinking about writing answers and what have you and now I'm asking you to click your mute button all the time. He's trying to say something to me just please one minute. Sure. Sorry, my name's Rich, I'm the IT guy. Um, I believe that if we had about five minutes, we could uh, uh, reboot the meeting from City Hall and see if that fixes the echo problem. So the rest of us would, you know, we can't stay in the meeting if you reboot, right? We all have to go out and start over? Would that be true? That's true. Uh, correct, but I would start with our phone bridge, which is just our connection to our uh, voice carrier, um, which would all still leave you in the meeting. So we would start with our phone bridge and reboot that and see if that fixed the echo, and uh, hopefully we'll be good after that. Okay, we will all stand by. And let me say to uh, participants, if everything goes black on our screens, um, my clock says it's 1.50. Let's all try to log back in at 2 o'clock if the worst happens in the meantime. But we will stand by and we will not log ourselves out. We'll see what happens. Uh, testing, testing, testing. Is that what you want me to do? Can can whoever is on hear me? Yes, I can hear you. And I can hear you. And I can hear a boom uh, lag in the speaker coming back at. So it's the same as it was before. No improvement. Correct. Correct. See, I said correct, and then about a half a second afterwards, I heard the whole entire word correct repeated 
obviously out of a speaker at City Hall. Mr. Roos, could you unmute yourself? Sure. Come back. When I said the word correct, did you also hear it repeated back? Just now? Uh, a couple of minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah, no, I did not hear it. I did not hear the echo then. You did not hear it. I'm, although I'm hearing a tiny echo for myself right now. So... Ah. Looks like Mr. Eglick's connection's been changed somehow. You have a different symbol for your for your audio. Can you unmute yourself and let's see what happens? I unmuted. Oh boy, now we're really hearing. I guess you could hear that too, Mr. Eglick. <laughs> oh, I don't understand because yesterday it, it happened a little bit. I could hear it faintly in the background. Uh, but nothing like what we're going through right now. Mr. Roos, be careful with those headphones. <laughs> if a well, guess... we, were just saying, we, were, we were just saying we were having a lot of problems yesterday until I used the headphones. I don't know if others could use headphones and that would help, but that seemed to have improved my situation. Yeah, see, they probably can't do it at City Hall because apparently they have a room full of people all sitting there, all listening. I see, right. Via one system somehow well it's it's not a room full it's a handful but um same point um I, we've now tried a different mic uh which is the the exact same mic apparently i had yesterday does that make any difference at all let's see what happens when i talk makes a huge difference yes yeah, so that is really that is really fascinating was the mic you just turned back in, was that mic 01 that's labeled podium? Yes. Yeah. No, that's the one I have now. Oh, the one, the one you have now is. The one I have now is podium table 01. Interesting, because that's a much hotter microphone. Huh? You, don't, you don't have to get as close to it for it to work. That's just my experience working there at, at uh, City Hall. Okay, it seems to be we're in good shape. Go. <laughs> Go while it's good, while the getting's good. I, I kind of lost my train here. Um, uh, I can't imagine why. <laughs> yes. Um,
You know what? Let me just ask, we're t just to try to pin down these, these townhomes, when the, uh, w w when the townhomes were eliminated from Block 8, and then there were, uh, I think the testimony was there was reconfiguration of the townhomes of Block 3 and 4. Did the number count change on Blocks 3 and 4 of townhomes? I believe so. And in what way? If you could bear with me to look that up. Can I, can I just ask again about the relevancy of this question, number one, and number two, are we pinpointing a change that occurred between what two periods of time? Relevancy, Mr. Redlick? <clears throat> well, I'm trying to understand how the townhomes came to be. I think we're now talking about 46 on three and four. I'm trying to understand how that number was arrived at. And how is, and how is that relevant? Well, there's a certain amount of townhomes th that are allocated throughout A1 and the other zones. I'm trying to figure out how this compares with the other zones and also the relative number for this particular location. What we what we have is an application, and I, I would point out that in the hearing examiner's pre-hearing rulings, um, it was noted that how the city reached its decisions was not relevant. You were interested in the substance of the decision. I feel the analogy here is going back and getting into how various things changed over time, how the numbers changed over time, how it went from one to another. We could be here for a long time discussing that, and I, this feels as irrelevant as I think you had decided the city's some of the city's process was to your ultimate decision making. Well, I, I don't think those two are comparable. Uh, we've been listening to a lot of testimony about this won't work and that won't work and this is why we're doing this and so on. I think we're entitled to know how that um, evolved into what was submitted to the city, whether or not uh, the city's decision complies with the code or the UZDP complies with the code and the plans and, and the applicable uh, standards um, isn't uh, an evolutionary question. To some extent, I agree with both of you. Um, I will allow some more questioning uh, because this is a central, as far as I can tell, a central aspect of the city's denial is the argument that there shouldn't be townhomes there. Um, and I think uh, it's fair to inquire a little further. So, objection overruled, at least for now. Thank you. So, I don't know about Mr. Zinzer, but I have no recollection of what your last question was. So, please repeat it for him. Well, I think we've established that the uh, blockade townhomes that were originally proposed were no more. They were not in the proposal as submitted to the city. I'm asking, did the block three and four townhomes change in terms of, I think the witnesses said they changed in some way in terms of configuration. And did the number go up or down uh, between the time of a plan that had block eight townhomes and between the time of submission of a plan that only had block three and four townhomes? I remember that was your question. Did the number go up or down? Mr. Zinzer? 
Can you? And by the me? way, I'm my, my mic was was just on, and how how was that? Was that okay, in terms of echo and all that? Yeah, and you don't have to be as close to that microphone as you did your other one. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's the one I always like to use when I'm there because you don't have to lean into it. So with the original, the original submittal on a November 4th, 2019, the townhomes were organized on three blocks. Again, this is a function of the configuration of that time with the chicane of Southeast, or I'm sorry, uh, 224th Avenue Southeast to the West. The combined number of those three blocks with townhomes was 34 townhomes. And I don't have that number. It would require some calculation. But the shift, if I might use this graphic as an example, or I can point to an exhibit that shows that submittal. Well, there are what? There are 48 now? There are 48 now, correct. So that answers. Uh, Mr. Reglick's question. It went from 34 to 48. Increase of 14. Right? Right. If, if I might have a minute, I may be done. There are 30 seconds. No. Oh. No further questions at this time, and thank you for your patience, including with the technical difficulties. You're more than welcome. Uh, before I ask Mr. Roos if he has any redirect, um, I think I have one, maybe two questions I would like to ask. Yesterday, Mr. Zinzer, uh, you described when you were talking about the, in fact, we can see the space on the, the uh, graphic that's there, uh, the complex, multi-use complex that's across fourth from block seven, uh, you were talking about how that intersection of 225th and fourth has the potential for commercial mixed use on all four quadrants of the intersection. I remember you talking about that. Also yesterday, you talked about how the area on the north side of 4th between 224th and 225th uh, would be a reasonably good or great, I don't remember what words you used, uh, location for a city square. Do those two arguments conflict with one another? The city square in that block and uh, the northwest quadrant of 225th, 4th, uh, providing a, a great commercial opportunity or mixed use opportunity? Not at all. They could coexist. Explain a little more, please. If in the future, and again, this is not STCA property, that parcel across the street from block six is developed as a mixed use building that would extend the pattern of mixed use development along that north south corridor. And if designed similarly to block six, it would frame one edge of that city square. Uh, 
Okay. Does the legend on there, um, on that light green parcel that says parcel, I can't, it's too small on my screen. Um, thank you. Parcel number and it's 9027. Uh, the word city of Sammamish underneath that, does that mean that it's owned by the city of Sammamish? That would seem to be the case. I believe this information was obtained from the county or city GIS. I'd have to check to see which source that was. Okay. Mr. Examiner. Um, we're, we're trying to we're trying to check that quickly and give you an answer. Um, we're not sure the city does own that, but we're checking right now. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, that's the only question I had. Mr. Roos, do you have any redirect? I do, just a few questions. Um, if we could go to exhibit 49A and 49B, those were the items from the Shook Kelly website that were added this morning. I'm wondering if City Hall could put that up. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure whether Mr. Sugg has had a chance to try and do anything permanent with those two exhibits. Mr. Sugg is here, and, and can you put them up, Mr. Sugg? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. He, one moment, please. He says he can, but meanwhile, um, can I report back on the ownership? Okay. We're sure of that. Uh, the, the, the wiser people than me here say that we don't own that, and the city does not own that parcel. That you were inquiring about. Okay. I'll take that as argument from an unsworn counsel. <laughs> well, actually, actually, from a from a city employee, <laughs> I could have them get on the camera and say it, but no. no. Okay. I'm going to hit mute again now, or whatever it is. When Mr. Sugg is, oh, there it is. Okay. Ah, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Sud. Mr. Okay. Roos, go ahead. Um, I was actually hoping to look at the next slide. There was two, so I guess 49B is the one that I have in mind. That one. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, Mr. Zinzer, on further review after the preparation of this concept diagram. Um, has a determination made has a determination been made that this is not a viable development concept? It has. It's, it is not a viable concept. And can you identify some of the factors that make this a non-viable development concept with respect to blocks four and uh, is that eight or an eight? Or an eight, yes. In particular, yes. This concept was prepared around the notion of the Notch property being the city square, whereby the perimeter of that square was established by that property line to create a viable commercial environment and space as part of that central open space green spine continuum. With guidance and comments from the city such that streets shall not be placed within the notch property, those building frontages would actually have to shift 
opening that space up, which in our opinion, renders a less feasible or unfeasible commercial frontage for that space. That in combination with a block structure that is required based upon public works, we could not achieve the block dimensions required to introduce that density at that location. Um, I believe you had indicated in your testimony with regard to this uh, green spine that the city had provided you guidance on how a green spine could be designed between blocks five and six, provided you had a 120 foot average width. Is that correct? That's correct. So the city did not have any objections to the green spine or a green spine being framed by the buildings proposed on blocks five and six. Is that correct? That's correct. There are pedestrian oriented buildings with ground floor commercial uses fronting along the green spine. And drawing your attention to SMC 21B.95.050.4, twenty-one b point nine five point oh five zero four a does it reference a central open space, or in this case, green spine? Being, being being ringed with pedestrian oriented buildings as one option? Yes. Okay, the reference again, 21B.95.0504A. Okay. And that would be consistent with the guidance that you received from the city in the diagram that you included with exhibit 1029 page 5 which is the handwritten drawing that it received from the city on June 3rd 2020 correct correct Mr. Eglick referred to two documents referred to as the Green Spine Design Companion and a guide to the development of the Green Spine. Do you recall that testimony? Yes. That, that question? Yes. Believe those documents are referred to specifically as the Green Spine Development Guide and the Green Spine Design Companion. Were either of those documents referenced anywhere in the first round of comments that you received from the city in March of 2020? No. And in the meeting minutes that you received from the city after your meeting on June 1st, 2020 to discuss the green spine which are included under exhibit 34 in the record under each of the city's responses there are references Is that correct
that would be on Exhibit 34, pages two to three, I believe. And if you can go ahead and turn to that Exhibit 34. Yes. And do any of those references that they direct you to include either the Green Spine Design Companion or the Green Spine Development Guide? No. To your knowledge, have either of those documents been adopted by the Sammamish City Council? Not that I'm aware of. Has the Town Center Infrastructure Plan been adopted by the City Council, to your knowledge? Yes, it has. It states so on the front cover. I believe. I believe there was some discussion with Mr. Eglick about the possibility of split street designations where one half of the street, say the west side would have one street designation and the east side would have a different designation. Is there anything in your reading of SMC 21B30 that precludes that sort of split designation? Not as I interpret it. Okay. I'd like to go to Exhibit 9, page 10, which I believe Mr. Eglick referred to in his cross-examination. You can tell me when you're there. Exhibit 9, page 10. Page 10, yes. number one, street, street front and, orientation. And, yes, and I'm looking under 1B specifically. It's the section that he referred to in his examination. And the sentence reads, the town center plan identifies the street network within the TCA1 zone. A parenthetical reference then to, follows the different streets as pedestrian oriented streets and corridors, including park edges for design review. Have you reviewed the town center plan in an effort? Did you, did you then, or have you now reviewed the town center plan in an effort to find that identification of the pedestrian oriented streets? I have. The town center plan does not identify the street typologies for pedestrian oriented or mixed use. So in your view, is that an incorrect or inaccurate statement in 1B based on your review of the town center plan? Based on my review, unless can be shown otherwise within that document. In your answer to a question from Mr. Eglick about whether it was, quote, possible to put a mixed use development on blocks three and four, you had said yes, that it is possible. Do you recall that answer? Yes, I do. It's possible, but it's not feasible for the reasons discussed yesterday, which include you know, commercial viability, compatibility, and the other factors mentioned in that discussion. So the fact that, did you mean that it's physically possible to locate the use? It's physically the possible, it's just not feasible within the context of the remaining commercial square footage and thinking about where that
would be most beneficial to the growth and pattern of commercial development within the town center TCA one zone. Do you believe that a mixed use development is viable on blocks three and four? No, I do not. And that relates to the factors that you mentioned yesterday. That's correct. Do you believe a mixed use development is appropriate on blocks three and four? No, I do not. And that again relates to the factors you mentioned yesterday. Correct. Mr. Eglick asked you some questions about a potential 30 foot setback from pedestrian oriented streets. Is that correct? That's correct. And in the pre application minutes that you received in May of 2019, the city indicated that townhomes were a permitted use with a 30 foot setback. Is that correct? That's along correct. Pedest along pedestrian oriented streets. That's correct. Was there any indication that the 30 foot setback had to be public or public uh, or dedicated to the public? No. Is there anything in the code that requires the 30 foot setback landscape setback area to be dedicated to the public? Not that I'm aware of. Could the city impose conditions or covenants on how that 30 foot open uh, setback area should be addressed? It does, it talks about landscape and amenities that should be provided within that space. And it could place conditions on a UZDP to ensure that occurs. That's correct. correct. Mr. Eglick, I believe asked you about the wedding cake design concept. Correct. And is it your view as an urban planner and in your experience that a wedding cake concept could be incorporated within the TCA1 zone itself with the step down, step, step down beginning within the TCA1 zone? Yes. And is it your view that beginning the step down within the TCA1 zone is appropriate here with respect to blocks three and four? Yes. Why is that? The proximity to 222nd in the R1 zone, the narrow nature of that block, the townhomes seem the most appropriate typology to introduce a viable development product to accommodate that wedding cake transition. There's been a lot of discussion uh, during the course of the cross-examination about the concept of mixed use. Yes. Do you have a view on whether mixed use is a vertical concept or a horizontal concept or both? In my view, it's, a, it's both. Mixed use projects can be vertically integrated or horizontally integrated. As we're talking about a mixed use area and a mixed use project, I think that's an appropriate way to envision those typologies working together. And is it your view that that concept of mixed use being both possibly vertical and horizontal, is that endorsed or recognized in the town center infrastructure plan? I believe it is. How so? Is it directly talks about the core mixed use area is the TCA one zone the core mixed use area. And there's language that gives guidance that 
It could be a vertical mix or a horizontal mix based upon the factors that we discussed yesterday, market forces, financial climate, land availability, and factors on the ground at the time of development. And is that confirmed in your view by the specific references to townhomes on page four of the town center infrastructure plan? That's correct. And the specific reference to a townhouse block typology in the town center infrastructure plan? Yes. Just checking my notes here. You had testified that multi-use development on blocks three and four would be, quote, complicated and, quote, challenging. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. Is it not only complicated and challenging, but more than that, given the factors that you described yesterday? I'm going to object. Um, we're doing a lot of leading, uh, so I, I hope I'll get the same leeway. But also, uh, it seems as if we're, we're not really doing uh, anything other than having the witness repeat the previous testimony. Sustained. Okay, I have I have no further questions. Thank you. Any recross? Without asking um, the same question. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mean sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander, whatever <laughs> that old time outmoded expression is? Um, I think so. Uh, I'll give it a try, and you can let me know if I'm if I'm not uh, within the guardrails. Um, I, I guess the first thing is, is you you went over with Mr. Ruth where the uh, the Green Spine Companion makes me think of Garrison Keeler, where that where that wasn't mentioned, but hadn't you already been told about it in, in uh, 2018? That's his question to you, Mr. Zinser. I believe that's when it was first discussed. So, okay. Did you ever tell the city, well, we're not going to pay attention to that because uh, it was a department document that, that the city council didn't uh, bless, hadn't been asked to bless. But I mean, did you ever tell the, the department that, that, that you weren't going to pay attention to it? No.
this is kind of a thicket, so we'll see how this goes. But you had a series of questions with Mr. Roos where the, using words, what's possible, what's feasible, what's viable, so on and so forth. Um, and I, I'd like to see if we can get some clarity on that. Uh, when you answered, as Mr. Roos reminded you had, that it was possible to do mixed use on blocks three and four, possible meant, didn't it, that it could be done. Isn't that correct? Correct. It's physically possible, but not feasible. And that's where I want to try to kind of clarify this. Feasible has an element in it, does it not, of, of your kind of commercial financial outlook? Is that correct? That's certainly part of it. And it also has uh, an element in it of your uh, opinion as a, well, I guess you're not really testifying here as an architect because you're, you're not licensed, but you're as a, someone who is involved in the planning for this project for the owner. Is that correct? That's correct. So are you saying that the city's judgment, which is based on different affiliations and factors on this issue is absolutely irretrievably incorrect? I would say I'm going, object, I'm going to I'm going to object to the form of that question. What's wrong with it? I don't know what it means. Absolutely irretrievably incorrect. I I think those adverbs are rather uh, generally understood than descriptive. Yep. Objection overruled. I would say perhaps it's uninformed relative to the remaining commercial space that's allocated for the TCA1 zone. And and that leads me to my, so that's your response. So then that leads me to my next question. You're saying, I think what you're saying is, and and, and I have to, confess I may be misunderstanding, that there's not a, enough square footage available for mixed use development of blocks three and four. Is that is that the gist of what you're saying? The remaining commercial development square footage it's 53,000 square feet. After we look at the programming of five, six, and seven. The question becomes, how do we maintain that commercial pattern and core that is established by the village Sammamish Town Center project? The balance of uses we've created with blocks five, six, and seven where does that remaining 53,000 square feet, where, where can that be allocated within this overall TCA1 zone that closely matches the, the, the vision for the TCA1 mixed use commercial area? And blocks three and four for the factors mentioned yesterday do not lend themselves to that distribution of commercial in that area. Is 
is that are you done yes okay so i hear you saying two things one the latter point you're making is this you're saying physically and i assume this is at least in significant part a reference to the uh the the wetland situation and and how that relates um has a challenge in hearing in it that's that's one thing you're saying is that correct yes the other thing you're saying is it's not that we it, and correct me if i'm wrong about this it's not that we don't have enough available developable square footage it's that this is in your opinion not not the place you want to put it is that correct no it's not well one out of two um what where did i go wrong If I understand your question, if there was more commercial allocation available, would we put it on three and four? I think what I was saying was that my understanding was you were saying you have that square footage that you mentioned available, but that you don't think it's advisable to put it on three and four. Isn't that your testimony? That's correct. And so that's feasibility. That's not feasibility, that's advisability. Is that correct? Be feasible as well. Feasibility. Well, on the square footage question, isn't it? advisability, not feasibility. It'd be feasible, feasibility as well. Okay. If we were to, if, if block three, for instance, was a commercial mixed use building, or let's say if it was commercial alone, we would be required to go underground with parking to provide the adequate supply. And it's just not feasible to do an underground parking facility for the amount of square footage that we would achieve on blocks three. That is just not feasible. In order for yeah, that no. to, to become feasible, we begin to have to look at adding other uses to it, which then drives the parking supply even more. So we're getting into um, balancing act of providing enough development to support the infrastructure that be required to support it. And that balance to achieve on blocks three becomes incompatible with the uses adjacent to it and the TCB transitioning into the C and nearby R1 district. Okay. Uh First of all, was the response you just gave with regard to a commercial development or a mixed use development? I think I spoke about two scenarios. One with just a commercial, a commercial use alone on that site following requirements of the pedestrian oriented street would require us to go underground with a parking facility that as a project is not feasible so your answer is that the response was about a commercial development as opposed to a mixed-use development is that your answer just yep. yes or no for that one okay what's the difference between a commercial development and a mixed-use development a commercial development is a single commercial use development. Commercial 
could be, you know, residential or not resident, I'm sorry, retail, restaurant, office, commercial type uses. I think he's through. Oh, okay. I didn't realize. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I didn't realize that. Um, my question was, what's the difference between commercial and a mixed-use development? I think you described commercial. Uh, what's the difference between what you just described and mixed-use? I guess I'll step back. Are we talking about a a project or a building? Well, what were you talking about just a minute ago when you talked about commercial? A commercial building. Okay. Let's take then apples to apples. What's the difference between a commercial building and a mixed use building? Commercial building would have commercial uses as allowed by code. A mixed use building would have a combination of uses. It could be commercial with residential, commercial with hotel, but it would be a combination of uses within a single structure. And residential is part of that mix, isn't it, for example? Yes. And are they, I'm gonna use one of your terms and maybe I won't use it incorrectly, but are the programming requirements for a commercial building and a mixed use building the same? No. And did you prepare a study of a potential mixed use building on block three, for example? I'm gonna object here for two reasons. One, I think it goes beyond the scope of the cross-examination. And secondly, it's been asked and answered in previous questions about market studies regarding various parts of the project. I, I'm not asking about a market study. I'm asking about a, uh, I guess it would be an ar architect study. I don't know what you would call it. With, I thought you used the word market. With respect to the latter half of the objection, um, I overrule it based on the clarification that he's not asking about a market study. Um, and what was the first half? Asked and answered? Several no, that times. It's, this, goes, this, goes well, beyond, this goes beyond the scope beyond of scope, the examination. Beyond yeah. scope. I'm fairly liberal with all you folks uh, about uh, cross-examination and following the, the uh, scope of the direct. So I'm going to be liberal here, overruled. Just, just to clarify the question, does it have to? Did you, did you use the term architect study or a market study? I just want to clarify what the question is. He wasn't. Well, I, I, go ahead. I was going to say what I thought you said, but you say it again. <clears throat> I, I think I clarified. I mean, architect study, or and and I don't know the correct trade term for for what I'm asking about, but I, I assume it's a study that you do to see what would be involved in doing a mixed use development, for example, on lot three or block three. There was not a formal, we call it development model study um, for three or four. It was a strictly numbers assessment based upon looking at general square footages and what demands would be required relative to parking to balance those uses on those sites. And that begins and, to... Sorry. That lets us know what our parking strategy is going to have to be to accommodate those uses. And a quick number of studies 
reveals to us that, you know, even with just one story of commercial development on those two, on either of those two blocks necessitates an underground parking facility. Now, just to be clear, are you talking about a mixed use development, which is what I asked about, or a commercial development? It would be for either or, but for a mixed use development, the, the parking would be even more substantial. There's a threshold of development you would have to achieve, and this would be a developer question in terms of the amount of density they need to achieve on that block to make that project viable. But again, this is for the developer as we talk about here now, but also the future in terms of the commercial square footage that's available. We have the entire TCA1 zone north of Southeast 4th Street. And again, we were building upon the core that was established by the village of, town, uh, village of Sammamish Town Center and the balance that we achieved with block five, six, and seven to um, continue that mixed use core and build upon it. We want to aggregate in the future to make those blocks sustainable and viable long-term. So again, it's physically possible to look at a mixed use project for three and four, but is it viable or feasible when we look at the context of the greater TCA1 zone and the forces that are in play there? I think I don't have any other questions. Let me check, though. Uh, thank you. No other questions right now. Thank you, Mr. Redlick, and thank you very much, Mr. Zinser. It is 2.50. We stand at recess for our 10-minute afternoon recess. Reconvene at 3 p.m. This conference will now be recorded. Thank you, and welcome back. It is 3.03 .03 p.m. on July 13, 2021. This is session nine in the appeal hearing of UZDP 2019-00562. Ms. Koloshkova, I believe it's time for another witness. Who would you have us call? Thank you. Um, I would call Mr. Pre I'm already stumbling. Peter Brennan, please. Mr. Brennan, if you'd hold your right hand up, please. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you'll be offering in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please state your name and tell us how to spell it for the record. Peter Brennan, and that's P-E-T-E-R, Brennan, B-R-E-N-N-A-N. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Your witness, Ms. Koloshkova. Thank you much. And is it possible from the city to have uh, Mr. Williams have the ability to screen share for a couple of exhibits as we go? Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. I know that the system said Dean Williams is able to present. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Williams is with me again in the room. Um, Mr. Brennan, thanks for your attendance this afternoon. Um, I guess I will ask you, have you been present for the testimony um, in this hearing to date? Yes, I have. Or I guess listening in, I shouldn't say present anymore. <laughs> um, 
can you tell us what your uh, involvement or role is with the uh, STCA application that's being reviewed today? Yeah, I am the senior project manager on the developer side. And uh, my role is to uh, work with the uh, land due diligence when we uh, put a, a parcel into contract. Uh, I manage the application submittals and the team that submits them. Uh, I work on budgets and also uh, project accounting. And is it fair to characterize you as the project uh, representative for purposes of the application we're talking about? Yes, that's fair. And do you work directly for uh, the, I guess, entities we're calling STCA, or do you have your own company, or do you work for someone else? I work for Innovation Realty Partners, who is a partner with STCA. Um, can you just give us a little bit of information as to, I guess, your your relevant experience and background um, that informs your work as a project manager and representative? Yeah, um, my project background is um, started in general contracting. So I did that for about 10 years, um, building a variety of projects um, in for single family, townhomes, condominiums, and apartments. Uh, and then uh, the general contracting uh, side, I transitioned further back into start doing the um, site development with uh, roads and infrastructure and that type of stuff, and then um, then continued moving further back into land use and entitlement work. And so I've been doing that for about the last 10 years. And how, I guess, have you been involved in working on the aggregation of properties that now involve this UCDP from, I guess, the get-go? Or can you describe sort of where you started with the whole project? Sure. I started uh, right about the beginning of 2015. <clears throat> and my role uh, is to pick up the, pro the, the properties once they've been put under contract uh, in a purchase and sale agreement. And uh, then at that point, there is typically a due diligence period where we as the potential buyer are able to evaluate the land, uh, run a, a series of um, consultants through there to um, analyze uh, environment, environmental concerns, um, identify any wetlands if there's any on the properties, um, to, uh, analyze the soils with our geotechnical experts uh, and um, we would uh, also conduct survey uh, do maybe tree analysis uh, if necessary on properties that were that had tree retention requirements so go I go through and uh, from that from the early stages of the project I was involved with the analysis of the parcels and then once that due diligence period was up we would make I would bring my results um, to our to uh, you know our team, and we would then decide to move forward or not with a particular parcel. Okay. And um, are you so so talking about all those different consultants? Are you involved in selecting all of the design, engineering, um, and other disciplines team that goes into? I guess, uh, submitting an application for these properties such as the CCDP, UZDP, excuse me. Yeah, I guess, just so I understand your question, is it, am I involved in, in managing the consultants that we hired to date or am I in charge of hiring the consultants? Um, I guess, I don't really care if you personally pay for them. <laughs> I'm asking about whether you're the one who puts the team together and works with the team um, for the application process uh, and communications with the city. Yeah, I think uh, you know we we uh, evaluate the consultants for our, that we want to represent us uh, from the development side, and then yes, I work with them directly on coordinating the components of. An okay, um, what were your priorities in terms of selecting? the right set of consultants for this project? 
Um, we wanted to have, I mean, it, it does depend on the consultant, but we wanted to have, um, you know, for, for geotechnical, for example, we wanted familiarity with um, the area and if they had done prior work in, in the Sammamish area um, and, and understood the soils in the area. So um, local representation was good there. Um, we also, for our engineer um, uh, core design, for example, um, we wanted someone who had also worked with the city of Sammamish, understood the application process, um, had been successful in, in submitting uh, applications and um, getting approved. Um, our wetland uh, person, we wanted to have familiarity with the Washington state laws, so um, also local representation. Um, on the master planning uh, with Shook Kelly, uh, that's a, 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 a different skill set because town centers are not necessarily, um, not everybody does them. And so Shook Kelly was selected because they had a particular expertise in um, doing town center developments. Okay, um, sorry, there's some fire engines going by here. So apologize for the noise. I can hear them too. Just so I know, have you worked on other town centers yourself? I have not. Okay, no. so I, I presume that means it was pretty important to get the right team together. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely was. I, I've been involved in uh, other projects where there was a commercial component um, and also um, that had a residential component, uh, but the town center in this particular example has a lot more of the mixed use uh, component, which um, uh, I had not been a part of it in historical projects. Okay. And um, are you the main, I guess, would, would it be fair to characterize you as probably the main um, contact person in working with um, the city and other involved jurisdictions? Yes, that's fair. Okay. All right. Um, so tell me, turning to the UZDP application, tell me about sort of a, a very, very big picture. What were the biggest, I guess, um, critical considerations you needed to focus on with the team in building um, what became the UZDP application? Yeah, I mean, the UZDP, uh, I think the, the application itself, especially in the TCA1, has a lot more complexities than perhaps some of the other projects that had already uh, gone forward and been approved. Um, the, the TCA1 has a green spine, uh, which is a, a, a component that is um, a design component that uh, the city was very concerned about. Um, also the road network and how that functions around the core mixed use area. Um, the core mixed use area is basically the, the, the key, uh, I would say commercial center for the town center. And so there was definitely going to be um, a lot of concern around how that was, um, that, that how that was going to be laid out. Um, I think regional stormwater was also always a big concern. And up to this point, we had seen three projects go forward, but probably still sitting in much more of an isolated uh, stormwater concept rather than regional, which is where the, the town center plan um, speaks to. Uh, and the three projects you just referred to, are those uh, projects that um, are, are those STCA projects or unrelated? Those are unrelated. Those are projects that had happened before us. I think we've talked about the one to the north, which is the TRF project. Uh, where they put the Met Market in and the Sky Apartments and some other retail. Uh, there was also another project in the Northeast Quadrant called uh, Plateau 120. And then another project in the Southeast Quadrant called the Ichijo Townhomes. Um, so those three projects uh, were before us. Were those UZDP projects or a different um, planning process? Yeah, all three were UZDP. They all had um, a zone, they were all in the, in the A zone. So the A zone, just to make sure everyone's oriented correctly, there's five different A zones. There's a, the A1 zone, 
which is in the southwest and uh, northwest quadrants. And I don't know, it may, may, I don't know if it's, if we want to look at a zoning map, but I, if you guys are familiar with that, I don't have to go through it. Um, but no, uh, I think we're fine. We can, okay. we can keep so going. They're We've all, they're all in eight zones, so they all require to use EDP. Okay. Okay. And were each of those UZDPs approved before you submitted the SDCA application or did those come um, in the intervening time? No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, they were all approved. Okay. Um, so I'd like to turn your attention to the, the underlying properties um, that are associated with this application. Can you talk to me a little bit about um, your work in addressing aggregation of the properties. And I might bring up, Dean, could you bring up exhibit 1031, um, page eight on the right-hand side? This might, if you wanna to refer to this, Mr. Brennan, you can. I just think it might be a little bit helpful to have a visual. If you have a different one, let me know. Yeah. But you know, I'm sure anything that shows all the parcels will help orient the, everybody. Okay. The, if you can zoom into the right hand one, it's probably the easiest one. Uh, you were on, you were on. Yeah. 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 Can you go to the zone map? Yeah, he's getting there. Okay. Tiny bit of lag. Okay, so I had asked you about the aggregation of parcels that you'd worked on um, that go mm -hmm. into this. You could maybe walk us through the work that so, went into that. I think the exhibit we need is the one of the all the town center and all the parcels to show you to explain the aggregation. So you were down just one. I think it was just down one more sheet. Okay. Just a moment here. All right, I just saw it. I don't know if it was up or down. Oh, it's uh, go back up to page six or maybe page seven. There you, there you go. That On the left side would be great. Okay, so this is the one that also has the zoning on it. Okay. Yeah, so we can start there. We can look at kind of all the parcels here. All right, so, do you remember my question? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> just about the aggregation? Yes. Right, so we started in 2015. And um, just to give a little bit of background, the, um, the town center was adopted in 2008. Uh, as many of us know, 2008 was uh, uh, not the greatest year in real estate. There was a major crash and the, the town center plan and subsequent development kind of got shelved. Um, the, uh, the, a lot of developers would come in and, and take a run at some of these properties. So the property owners themselves were not um, extremely open because they had um, open to talking because they had kind of had fits and starts of trying to sell their property as a town center property. Um, so we came in in um, 2000, late 2014, um, and I started in 2015 with the first acquisition of some parcels. Um, and those, um, it, I mean, we, we started with about eight parcels in the beginning and we grew that to um, just about 51 parcels. And the, the total amount of parcels in the town center is 102. Um, in regards to um, the, the total acreage, I think it's uh, roughly, I wanna say it's 220 acres, I think. I'm sorry, you moved away from your mic. Did you say 220? Yeah, I think it's about 220 total acres. Um, total well. acres of the town center, is that what you're saying? Yeah, and so um, we have now acquired about nine, just north of 90 acres uh, in the town center. Uh, that spans the TCA1 zone, where we have uh, almost 24 acres, the TCA3 zone, which we have about four acres, the TCA4 zone, which is about three and a half acres, the TCB zone, which is just north of 40 acres, and the TCC zone, which is just under 19 acres at 18.63. So we've been up there. Excuse me. Um, 
could you go back to the numbers in the A1 zone, 24 acres? Yep. Then I missed your next one. TCA3. So that's over there in that southwest quadrant. That is 3.94 acres. Uh, approximately one? Approximately four acres. So it's 3.94. Oh, 3.94. Okay. And, and A4 was three and a half? TCA4 is, yeah, about just about three and a half. It's 3.54. And B was 40. Yep. And C is 19. Yeah. Is that right? Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. So that aggregation has taken us, you know, uh, uh, you know, from 2015 to, you know, current day. And the, the challenge uh, with the aggregation was first to, you know, earn the trust of the, of the, the sellers and um, convince them that they, we were a real buyer. Um, and then as we went through the aggregation, um, like I said before, I did all the due diligence. So we evaluated the parcels, made sure that they were all parcels that um, checked out or with all of our consultants and we wanted to buy and that we felt that were that fit into our goals for the, the planning side. So just roughly, if I can just kind of walk through real quickly, uh, kind of what that looks like in the south west quadrant here so where we've got the the uzdp application we own everything in that southwest quadrant except that property that says a-4 on it um down in the so working west to east you, you own yeah. the c the b the a1 and the b and the b and then we own that that b is kind of interesting it's a it, it's a split zone there in the in that last parcel so the part that's kind of a triangular a zone parcel there uh -huh. uh, off the A4. We own that triangle, but we don't own the rectangle portion that has the actual uh, letters A-4 in it. And, and then that, I'm sorry, go ahead. That do parcel, you, go ahead. Do you, wanna... do, you, do you own the D zone? D is in David? D zone, no. That is the city and the city's acreage there is about 30 eight acres it looks like uh, and that includes you've got where the d is is the sammamish lower commons um, that little finger that sticks up to the north is a um is the notch property i believe we've all talked about um, as we go south you have um the city hall and you have the ymca property and the library right there and then there and then there is that one last property, the A5 zone, which is currently a school right now, which we do not own that property. Do you know why that property you just referred to as the Notch property is referred to as that? Um, I don't. I mean, the, the city, I think, dubbed that the Notch property um, to help identify it um, as separate from the Sammamish Commons. And um, it's been a property that they've had. and um, it was one that, that sits kind of in a, um, in a key location, certainly for the town center. Is it, do you know, have you been out to the site recently? Um, not recently with kind of all the restrictions, but, um, recent within enough. The last, I guess within the last six months or year. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that, is that site vacant or I'm just curious if that's being, is that, or is that like an actively used property? I'm, I'm just interested to get a little bit of the lay of the land there. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a, operated as a, a public works um, kind of storage yard is how it's been for a long time. I know when they were doing the, uh, the Southeast fourth street project, that parcel was uh, where Marsh Bank had their, their construction trailers and probably some other uh, overflow materials. And um, and then um, actually during that project, we uh, had Mar allowed Marsh Bank to use part of our part, one of our parcels to um, do some lay down area to assist the city with the Southeast fourth project. So, um, but right now I think it's reverted back to the uh, public works, just uh, kind of a uh, overflow storage area. Okay, okay. Um, so then let's go back to, so, well, so let me ask you, yeah, let me go back then. 
I'm sorry. Do you want me to keep going with the rest of the holding? Oh, sure. I was just going to reorient you to that. So please do. Okay. <laughs> so then north of fourth, we have all of that property in the A1 zone, um, except the, the parcels that are already developed in the TRF project right there, which is Sky Apartments. And just to be clear, when you say north of fourth, you're referring to southeast fourth. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, sorry. Southeast okay, fourth. I just want to make sure because remember, this is a record. So <laughs> sorry about that. great. Go ahead. Um, and then if you go north in the B zone from the TRF project, there is a uh, quite a large parcel right there. That is a school. Yep, you got it right there. That's a school. We don't own that, but we own everything else in the B zone north of that. Um, and then in the C zone, um, if you go to your left on that little kind of, uh, I guess, what is it, trapezoidal or uh, right there, yep. That parcel and everything down, we do not own in the C. Um, and we uh, don't own those two blocks to the north the very north, but we own everything else. We own that that large uh, rectangular property and then that section there that uh, Dean's using his cursor on. And because I interrupted you before, can you reiterate for the A1 zone that is north of Southeast 4th? Um, could you clarify that holding again, please? That's about 13 acres. I'm sorry, and so is that all of the A1 that STCA owns or? So we own that, we own, and then we own all that A1 that is identified south of Southeast 4th. So part of that is in the application and there are blocks eight and nine that are outside the application. I don't wanna derail us too far, but there were some questions. I don't know if you heard them from the examiner related to areas that have been identified as potential locations for something called a city square north of Southeast 4th. Would mm -hmm. that is that location on STCA property or someone else's property? That's on our property. Okay. Okay. Um, does that complete uh, your description of the, I guess, relevant STCA A aggregation? The, for the A1 aggregation, yes. Um, like I said, we also have that little triangular sliver of A4. Um, and then we also have some A3 that is in the Southwest quadrant. We own all that uh, except for that, where exactly where the cursor is right now on that corner parcel, we don't own that. And then you can see just to the South of the A3 is where the Ichijo townhome project is, which was a 75 unit townhome project in the A3 zone. Okay. Um, and then in the B zone there, we don't own that large parcel that is to the east of A3, where it says A3, there's kind of a big, large rectangle. Nope, we don't own that. Uh, but we do own south of that. And I think we, we own those two, that little parcel there that the curse is on, the one with the B in it. And then I don't believe we own the next two parcels as, uh, and then we own the last one that is touching Southeast 8th. Okay. And then up in the Northeast quadrant in that B area, um, I forget the exact acreage, but we own a, a series of, of those smaller parcels up there. Nothing okay. in the view, but that's essentially the holding. Okay. Um, So let me turn your attention to this um, UCP application process. When you started it, can you talk a little bit about what your, I guess your expectations were in terms of um, how you were gonna need to move forward uh, with the city in order to get to an application? Yeah, I mean, I, I, in the beginning part, when we started aggregating property, uh, we definitely started having some meetings with the city to discuss um, what we were doing, that we had properties under contract, um, and that we were, um, you know, looking to understand the application process and, and what our options were as far as 
you know, product types and things like that. Um, the challenge certainly throughout the early years of the aggregation was that, you know, everybody didn't just come running to sell the property to us. It was, um, like I said, there were, there's 51 parcels. So there was a lot of, it was stitched together and there were holes. Um, there were key parcels that were, that we didn't have under contract and we were trying to figure out how to put an application together. So it, it was a moving target because as we would get down the road of potentially submitting something, uh, we might have then made a breakthrough with a, with a land seller and then put a parcel under contract and, and that changed the focus of things and how we may look at an application and, and how we may want to submit. So it was, um, you know, it, it just was a very fluid process of where we were talking with the city and trying to formulate how best to apply and, and where to apply. And in that process, did you review the city's adopted, I guess, plans and various materials related to the town center? Yeah, yeah, we read through that. Um, and, you know, it's, it takes a few reads to retain it. Did you did you take a look at? I presume you looked at code. Did you look at the town center plan and the infrastructure plan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those those documents, kind of the key documents, were certainly code, TCIP, and um, and the uh, and the adopted town center plan. Okay. okay. Um, so when you started working on the UCDP, I guess. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the process of getting into the pre-application um, for the UCDP. So were you the main person, um, I guess, organizing and collaborating with the city at that time? Yeah. I, I guess I shouldn't, perhaps I'll clarify with a couple questions. You were, I presume, not the only person from the team meeting with the city. Is that fair? Um, Probably not the only person, but I was generally, I would say, in almost every meeting. Yeah. Okay, great, great. So you're you're a good person to talk to about the, I guess, the iteration, the iterative process that went into the pre-app work. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I, I definitely probably was the most involved, um, uh, certainly from our side, and uh, definitely, uh, and I would think that. There was no consultant that probably went to more meetings than me. They might have gone to a meeting just to attend something that I possibly couldn't have made um, to get some uh, to keep the the process flowing. But I was there at most meetings. Okay, why don't you give me um, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just give me a high level of um, how the meetings proceeded leading up to the formal pre-application work in that roughly 2019 period. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to be honest with you, it was, you know, an evolution based upon how our aggregation was going. I think in the beginning, it was, it was certainly very nice, uh, very helpful to, to give us information, but, um, it, you know, it, they, probably the city was still trying to evaluate how, how realistic we were in um, our endeavors with the town center. Um, we were excited about it because the city had already done a really uh, much of the heavy lifting with the putting together the plan, putting together the zoning, putting together all these things that we could just, you know, move forward with implementing their plan. So it was, we were excited about it. Um, as we started ditching together more properties, um, we were able to overcome one of the biggest hurdles um, it, for, I think from the city side, certainly noted in the adopted town center plan, which was aggregation. I mean, if someone doesn't come in and start stitching these pieces together uh, over time, then the town center may not um, may not come to fruition. Uh, may not come to fruition in the way that the city had envisioned it. Um, probably, you know, with multiple developers, where we had already seen that from three other developers, it was probably going to take time to just um, have it all come together in that manner. So. We were removing obstacles for the city by 
taking on the aggregation component and getting things together in a manner that, okay, now we can submit uh, an application that is all these pieces, all contiguous. Here's here's a layout that we would like to, um, you know, talk to you and collaborate with you on that that we feel you know is a represent representation of your plan. So um, I think as we got uh, as we approached into the pre-app, um, we had had a lot of meetings with the city and had had a lot of um, discussions and talks. Um, the city, though, was, I think, at some point, the city was taking a position that we can't really uh, have many more conversations without something real in front of us to comment on, like formally comment on. So, like, so they wanted us to pre-app, they wanted us to provide an application in that they could then um, have as a framework for them to provide comments and feedback to us. Okay. Uh, before, well, I guess, um, let me turn your attention to exhibit seven, um, which is labeled a memorandum of understanding. Are you familiar with that document? I am. Okay. And can you talk to us about um, what led up to the need for that document? Yeah, so uh, I believe the city was in a uh, moratorium at the time and the I, I believe the memorandum of understanding was uh, if we if we've had an MOU with the city we were able to um, that the city that the council agreed to we were able, able to apply on but able to make an, an application to the city uh, that comply with the parameters of the memorandum of understanding. Okay, and I'm going to turn uh, looking at pages two and three of that document subsection or pardon me section. Well, let's start with um, looks like section B talks about series of phases. So can you explain what that concept of phasing was in the context of that memorandum of understanding a little bit? Yeah, if you don't mind, I just want to reorient myself with it. Yeah. Is, exactly. Can you, do you have a copy of that in front of you or do you, or can you see it okay? Um, I probably, yeah, I can see it. Um, so I'm wondering, it talks about STCA not agreeing not to apply for additional phases of development. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the background is as to why, um, I guess, why would you, why would you agree to that limitation on your own development when you're doing all this aggregation work in order to develop the property? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, for us, we, you know, had in mind that we were going to apply on a certain number of units. And uh, I think this document helped memorialize the fact that we weren't gonna come in with, you know, a thousand units or try and uh, plan something that was the entire Southwest and Northwest quadrant. So, um, you know, the, what we were, what we were, uh, what we wanted to do was come in with a, you know, an application that was a, a reasonable application, um, provided a, um, a, a good amount of development from our perspective. Um, and and so when the city read that and understood that it wasn't our intention, and we had had conversations with the city about that, um, I guess it was just um, something that helped provide a, a, little, a little more of a security blanket that we were gonna come in with um, you know, a certain amount of commercial, a certain amount of units, and we weren't going to exceed that. Okay. And I, when you're talking about that certain amount of commercial, for example, above um, in section three, commercial square footage, um, the text there refers to a maximum of 100,000 square feet. Um, that yeah, mean? that we were saying we wouldn't go over that 100,000. We were asking for the 100,000. As a maximum that we would not exceed in the in our application. And 
in in that respect then is that maximum only for the parcels that are subject to the current UCDP application or is that for more area well if we scroll down i think we've provided a a, a graphic there of all the parcels that were included in the MOU okay and that's on page five i believe there we go yeah there you go okay so the if you can recall what blocks eight and nine are um, basically those blocks that flank the notch property um, those parcels um, are not uh, included in this um, in the uzdp and so this um, this graphic shows that um, as well as uh, the red blocks to the east those are b zone properties that we also um, I put in the MOU uh, that we ended up uh, not applying on in um, either the UZDP or you could uh, use that. You could do that as a flat as well. Okay, and that is the B zone also a mixed use zone? Uh, the B zone can be uh, depend okay. if you uh, are applying with that with the B zone in conjunction with a, a zone application. I see. Okay. Um, I don't want to go astray too far. Um, so, in other words, that hundred thousand max goes beyond. I guess you you better be careful how you calculate where you put what commercial space, or you could get yourself in some trouble. <laughs> it seems to be a bit of a warning there. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the, the commercial space is there is some flexibility on where you can put commercial space, and I think the the key to for us was planning, you know, a core mixed use area that you know, had um, a good consolidation of, of retail and commercial space, um, so that it was um, it was it, the blocks remained walkable, that the retail environment was walkable, that you were always considering the pedestrian. The idea for the town center was that you park once and then you are walking to all the retail environment and that you're not um, that you're not um, jumping in your car to go to the next retail shop um, the other challenge with some of that b zone i guess that gets closer down to 228 we start encountering a lot of grade slope there um it, the, the the purple parcels are really up on a more of a plateau area flattened area uh, it still has some grade to it but the red is really an area that you start traversing down grade. And um, and so that would be a consideration if we were ever to consider retail. Okay. So once you have this memorandum of understanding in place, um, did you then start moving forward with, how did you arrive at Talk to me about the process of at arriving at what we currently see as the UZDP versus this drawing here, which has obviously a, a different set of holdings. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, did you just do it on your own? Did you meet with the city? Talk to us about how that process started to unfold. So I guess the the, the next step there was that we started um, working on our pre-app and um, and what we the, the pre-app i guess we started working on a plan for what we would submit and have a formal pre-application um, for our basically a zone b zone and c zone properties so uh, basically um, our pre-app covered it didn't cover that red area um, and it covered all the purple the red and the beige to the the west uh and then i think if we understand block nine maybe uh dean if you can put your cursor on that parcel uh in the, uh, the purple parcel right there yeah um what we were showing there on the pre-app was um basically an infrastructure around that block uh but not necessarily um the building of that uh the vertical construction of that block 
Um, so what we then did was we were uh, working to create this urban core area, this mixed use area and retail environment. So we had identified 82,000 square feet for our pre-app that we wanted to submit on for commercial space. We had, uh, I think, 300 apartments, uh, 114 townhomes, and 10 single family. And, and that included, can we go back to that, um, Peter, would it help can we, for us to go back to that 1031 page eight where we've got all the different blocks? Sure. Let's do that. Um, okay, so this, so so what you're talking about now is a larger area than the current UZDP, correct? Yeah, we had block eight in our original pre-app. And, and I, I think, I guess it's important to understand that we've been referencing block numbers here in a manner that pretty much, I think, reflects this last plan. But I think it's important to, to note that we had an original submittal on November 4th, 2019. That was a different block configuration. And then we had um, even a different block configuration on our pre-app. So it is important for us to identify which blocks and also which application when we're making those references. Okay, fair enough. So I, I would like to say just for our purposes, if we are referring to blocks three and four, we're gonna refer to those as those are reflected on this plan. If you're gonna talk about any other, um, I guess, prior iteration of blocks, let's just make sure we're clear about talking about a prior um, orientation or iteration, if that's fair. So. Um, orient you back to the pre-app, okay. block four um, was originally where block eight is and was actually a bit larger. So we had, um, and then block one was really, um, they didn't have the street cutting through it. So we had basically our, our 10 single family homes and then we had uh, a fairly similar <laughs> configuration. Was that? Oh, sorry, that was just coughing. Okay, so um, we had block one was had those those 10 single family homes did not have the road uh, cutting uh, west through it. And we had townhomes then on the other side of the alley there. And then we had, I believe, a, a road that went there. And then we had, um, then we had some blocks for townhomes. So we had basically a block of townhomes up where block three is, and then we had two blocks of townhomes where basically that spanned from that park area that is west of block four all the way through block eight it was kind of two blocks of townhomes. So the, 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 our, our block four in the pre-app was abutting the city square, which would, would what we had identified as the city square in the pre-app, which is the city's notch property. Okay, and why, I guess, why why did you, well, why did you identify that as a quote, city square, unquote? In, so in those yeah, areas? that's a good question. So we had been talking with the city about, you know, the, 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 the city square and location and, um, you know, I, Actually, I guess- And, and the, let me back, can I, before we go down this road, there's been a lot of assumptions that everybody seems to understand what city square means. Is that to, to when you looked at all the documents, was that a term that shows up in code in the town center plan, in the town center infrastructure plan? Tell us a little bit about where that idea comes from. Yeah, I think it it's, it is a bit of a confusing concept because um, there's there's some discussions about some open spaces um, in the adopted town center. Object, Mr. Examiner. This witness was listed as a lay witness. Um, he's now getting into interpretation of his, uh, I guess, his reading of the code and various other materials. And we've had witnesses who've testified to that on on his behalf, but. 
uh, we, there's been no foundation laid for his expertise. There maybe there could be, and and I would like to voir dire if there is, but but we don't have a resume. We have nothing other than Innovation Realty Partners, uh, uh, Mr. Brennan. Ms. Kaloshkova. Thank you, Mr. Examiner. Mr. Brennan is certainly the project. I, well, he testified as to some of his experience and we can get into it more. Mr. Brennan is testifying as the project representative and um, I would say as such has to have, particularly for a project like this, a particular level of understanding of the various requirements that go into putting together a UCDP is not testifying as um, a engineer or an architect at all, but I do believe it's very consistent with just about every project manager that runs a project in any local jurisdiction under the Growth Management Act to have a working understanding of codes and plans. Um, I, I will say I don't have an intention necessarily to enter this witness as an expert, as we do have a plan, a urban planner on staff, but frankly, Mr. Brennan can be entered as an expert, expert if we need to go down that road. He certainly has the qualifications, but again, as the project representative, it seems like that's going to go beyond um, what, we, what we're asking him to testify to for the most part. Well, may I, may I respond no, briefly? I don't need a response. I've heard from both of you now. Um, bottom line, objection overruled. Whether he's an expert or not, he is the lead representative, according to his testimony, for uh, this application for the applicants group. Uh, whether he has an expert understanding of the code or not, uh, it's his understanding that was being used uh, as the lead representative uh, for the applicant. And so I think we're entitled to hear what he thinks these things meant to him. Uh, and so I'm going to allow that. Now, whether qualifying him as an expert makes a difference to you two attorneys, I don't know. Uh, but I consider that he is going to be subject to cross-examination, whether he's formally considered an expert or not. So I don't see that as an issue. Objections overruled. And I, I do want to be clear that we did anticipate this witness would be subject to cross-examination. Um, so he is forewarned and forearmed, as all our experts or witnesses always are. <laughs> so please do not have any concerns in that regard. Um, but that being said, that Mr. Brennan, so I had to ask you about, uh-oh, uh-oh. My goodness. Oh, it's happening to all of them. Is it City Hall or is City it us? Hall, up in the well, I haven't touched my computer, so it's not mine. You're not going when I talk? I think it's over. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, it might be City Hall. Dean was just whispering to me that he can he can hear a echo when that one's on, so we might not want to watch out for that mic. We're fine. Continue okay. with your questioning. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Brennan, I was asking you in in figuring out this sort of city in in this idea of City Square and what it is, um, where to place it. Uh, you were talking a little bit about trying to figure out what that beast is under the plans and codes. Could you describe that a little bit for us? Yeah, I mean, I, it, there's, I think there's some discussion in the adopted town center plan, you know, about some some more central areas uh, within the the different quadrants. Um, I think the city square concept really is. Um, we first really see it in the town center infrastructure plan, um, but it really isn't um, really defined in and given um, firm parameters. I mean, there is some, some language in there that says it should be north or south of southeast fourth. Um, I think the city square, if we can step back a little bit, um really functions much more as 
is how does the city want to use it? So in those conversations with the city uh, leading up to the pre-app, we were, we had talked about, you know, this location and- Let me pause you. When you say we had talked about, are you talking about internal conversations or conversations with this, with, with city representatives? Conversations with uh, with city representatives. I mean, we were um, we were there had been conversations before. Um, we uh, I know that I had talked with the the uh, we had had conversations um, a, a parks conversation after the Green Spine uh, Companion uh, document, and um, you know, I think that the city was trying to give us the requirements of what they were looking for on the city square. So the important component there is that the city square was something that they wanted to do farmers markets in. And then they also wanted to have, you know, events and whatnot at the city square that could be uh, operational from just how it functions normally. But then they also wanted to be able to scale that city square um, so that it could handle perhaps say like a larger concert um, or perhaps even in a much larger scale where uh, the city has their 4th of July um, real festivities um, down there in the lower Sammamish Commons and the city square, then we might look at that as um, flexing again to accommodate even larger crowds. So in conversations, um, with city uh, about potential locations, you know, we we started talking about, you know, how that looks as, as uh, you know, connected with the um, connected with the lower Sammamish Commons. Um, it hit a few, it hit several, um, I think, concepts that we were talking about, and the ability for the for the that city square then to potentially. Um, flex for the different uses that the city was considering, as well as use the lower Sammamish, Sammamish Commons as spillover for really large events. Um, it becomes a, a gateway from the lower Sammamish Commons into the town center uh, that then continues with the green spine going north. And uh, also the, the, it also functions really well as a spot for regional stormwater as it's the lowest point um, in the um, in the southwest quadrant here, in the um, you know, it's a it's a low point for as it as it transitions into the lower Sammamish Commons. So it's it had a lot of um, a lot of merits to that location, um, and so that's where we had identified it on our pre-app, uh, hoping to have more discussion about that location with the city. So I guess did you what happened with that discussion? Um, so we pre-apped on it and, um, we got our pre-app comments back. And roughly when, just, just to actually, I'm sorry, roughly what time frame is this so that we can make sure we're following a continuum here? So I think, uh, April, 2019, we had submitted that pre-app. Um, and then, uh, I think we had our pre-app on 523. 2019 and got comments shortly thereafter. Okay, so yeah, where did this concept, what happened with this concept? Well, so the, uh, I think if, um, I think if we can pull the, the pre-app notes up, um, I think- Is that exhibit nine? Um, so if we go to the parks, comments on this i think parks had um yeah they had they had the most comments on it obviously since it's a park and they're they're have some of the bigger concerns about how their parks would function um but we we look at um that's open spaces i dean it's down it's down a few more pages where it's actually um it is the it's titled parks department and their comments document page 19 might be big step one. there you go so um we 
get the comments back and the city you know, uh, was, we've identified it as the city square um, and they acknowledge that it, how we call it city square or referred to as the town center plaza by the city. Um, you know, and then they're saying that it needed to be included in the UZDP if we were gonna apply on it. Um, and we start, you know, we have a uh, stormwater vault on there. Um, uh, one of the more interesting or not interesting, but I'd say one of the more substantive comments that we wanted to you know, explore more with the city was that um, that they had said we had townhomes um, uh, with some live work units abutting the uh, the city square. And which number of which comment number are you referring to? Number four there on the exhibit. So, you know, they're saying the city square town center plaza is intended to serve as the primary open space of the green spine framed by bustling storefronts, cafes and businesses spilling into the public realm to activate the space with people as noted in the town center infrastructure plan. So we propose townhomes that were abutting that liver residents students and um, so they say, explain how the city square town center plaza isolated by streets and parking and surrounded by residential uses would serve as an engaging public amenity and enjoy the vibrancy envisioned in the Sammamish Town Center plan. Um, so we certainly heard that from that comment that the townhome was not the most um, desirable product type uh, adjacent to the city square as we have proposed it. Um, so down a little bit further, uh, Dean, in the, some of the red comments there, um, if you go down, it says 12 and, 13. You know, 12 and 13 or 13, it says the Vapian wishes to further discuss design alternatives to the Green Spine prior to submitting the UZP application. Supercoast additional should be provided, demonstrating compliance, Title Tunnel and the SMC and the Town Center Infrastructure Plan. So what we took away from this was that, okay, we wanted to explain to the city how to make that space a vibrant space. The challenge with a large open space is that um, pedestrians, just from a human nature standpoint of, of what we had understood from our consultants, is that uh, they won't cross large spans of open space, um, typically, for um, you know, if there's retail, if there's not a sense of enclosure. And so what we wanted to discuss with the city is if we if we wanted to change the the product type there to from townhomes to um, to some sort of mixed use in commercial environment, uh, we really wanted to help the city or we wanted to talk with the city about how to create enclosure there. Uh, the space there, um, I believe, was like 183 feet wide. And so what we wanted to talk with them is how to create that enclosure with structures there so that we could then um, make the space uh, workable for the retail environment, which is extremely important for what the city wants, which is the bustling streets and the retail environment. It's important to us because we want to see it thrive and and not be um, a, you know a drain or empty storefronts. And we also um, want to make sure that um, you know we are working together with the city to hit the other goals, which would be that they have this space that can, I guess, scale up and down towards the events and the things that they wanted to do. Um, so we did schedule a meeting uh, post uh, pre-app and we provided a, a, a presentation that talked about the enclosure, talked about... Um, before you go too far down that road, before we leave this pre-app, I also want to uh, orient you. Can we go back to page six of the pre-app? Because I want to clarify one thing here. Sure. There's a table there that talks about townhomes. Can you tell us what you understood that table to, to explain regarding townhomes in the A1 zone? That they're allowed. Um, yes, with restrictions, which would be 30 feet from a setback from the sidewalk, but they're allowed okay. in the A1. Okay, so, okay, so, 
let's go back to your takeaways, which is that I think you were just describing what you did next as far as um, after that conversation. Yeah, so I mean, what we wanted to do then was discuss, because this was really a collaborative piece here. I mean, we're, we're talking about a city square. This is a, a, main, a main component of the town center. It uh, would abut the lower commons, would be, you know, like I said, a gateway into the town center uh, from the commons. A real, real um, great showpiece for the city. And it requires collaboration with them on the different components of how to make it how to make it work. So we provided them with uh, some conceptual, or we provided them some um, examples of enclosure of where good enclosure is working and where um, enclosure was, um, it started getting too far for the pedestrian. Are you referring to other town centers um, built elsewhere in the country or are you talking about just kind of hypotheticals? No, we were uh, we were using um, I, other town centers, and then we also uh, I think one of our examples was the Redmond Town Center, which has a, 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 a quite a big open space there, where we were trying to show how that lacked the enclosure um, that we were looking for for a, um, a successful town center, so um, or accessible environment of retail around a a large open space. So. Um, we provided that and then we also provided some examples of how to um, do maybe one-way Wooner type streets that were modeled after uh, Park Lane in Kirkland um, where the Wooner is a street that is something that is um, it, it does have cars but it really gives priority to the pedestrian uh, pedestrian can cross that street that street can be uh, closed off with bollards or um, cones or whatnot to create a much more of a, uh, a festival type situation. And um, that also allows a lot more seamless pedestrian activity moving from um, retail to open space to retail again. Um, and then we showed how a further flexible uh, option would be for the larger events could be really closing off Southeast 5th and Southeast 6th. And then closing those streets off, we showed how circulation could work uh, on those blocks. And we were saying that this was now a, a good, uh, a really good option for the, all the things the city was looking for, as well as then we could talk about regional storm and a lot of components. But um, when we submitted that, the city responded, well, Kelly Hilde responded to me saying that we didn't meet the, the pre-app notes and we weren't gonna have a meeting and we needed to relook at the pre-app notes and resubmit. Um, so for so from that from that email and uh, it it did not seem that and that that was not our intention. It was to have a collaborative conversation to then start start discussing how this green spine and how integration with retail could work and how we can all benefit and work together on this um, to all uh, leave you know, the things we're looking for out of that area, which is so critical to the town center. From that email, we decided to modify from the pre-app to um, exclude block eight and block nine and the notch as part of our application. So we, we, we then said, okay, we, we view this now as a longer conversation, and one that from a time frame standpoint is probably not, um, not going to get resolved by the time our pre-app um, would expire. So, so we, ex I, I, just so I understand, so I guess excluding blocks eight and nine would allow you to continue to have a conversation if you wanted to, but I mean, were you hearing any concerns about the rest of, of the mix at that point? The, sorry, say that again? I, I guess, as I understand what you're saying, you were talking, you were just talking about pulling out what's now called blocks eight and nine from the UCDP, but were you hearing concerns about, or I guess, I guess overarching concerns about the way the rest of the design was going for the other blocks? No, I mean, blocks five, six, and seven were 
have been the same since the pre-op to the first application submittal to the the last application submittal. Um, okay. We really the concern that we were identifying with the city was the townhomes on the city square, and so by removing block eight and the city square and block nine, we basically were allowing ourselves you know the ability to discuss that area and that integration with the city in ongoing conversations but got to understand too there is a six month window that you can apply for your application from the pre-app so it's only good for six months so where we were at uh on that denial uh i don't know we've got that uh, exhibit somewhere um from the city, but we. Uh, what document are you looking August. for? That was in August of 2019. So, you know, we were at May, June, July, August. So we're roughly three months into uh, past our pre app, and we only have three months to go to get it in. So gotcha. we decided and that that conversation would make better sense to a uh, table for a future because we were now wanting to make sure we submitted in our application before the deadline of the six months. And how does the concurrency certificate process play into that consideration? Well, you need to have a concurrency certificate to apply. So concurrency um, with that, with that um, rejection of that, we, um you know decided that we would apply for our concurrency based upon how we were looking to apply for our first application so we applied on concurrency at 300 townhome or sorry 300 apartments 82,000 square feet of commercial and i believe 57 townhomes so that so that concurrency was based on the pre-app guidance that you'd gotten or did you just or i mean that was based the on, from. that was based on um, the the pre-app plan because I think how we had it originally was that we had um, we had probably 30 33 33 34 townhomes there um, on the on the east uh, or no the west side of 224th. And we had originally, I think we had 24 townhomes on block eight, the original block eight that they were um, concerned about. So uh, I think we we had done our concurrency on that, but we removed those 24 townhomes from the application as a, you know, as I've already explained. So um, so we had put our concurrency in, and we also got feedback from the pre-app that. Um, the B zone property could be, um, it could be a uh, included in a UZDP, or it could be in a flat. And I think the way the B and the C zone were working, as far as you know, based upon how our roundabouts were and how we were looking at um, submitting a plat for um, for those properties, the B and the C, it made sense to segment that off regardless of whether the b went in the uzdp or not the c zone is not allowed to be in a uzdp so we we were we thought well i guess we originally kind of pre-apped on a c zone b zone and a zone all together um but then the city made it clear that the c would have to be submitted as a plat and the A had to be submitted as UZDP, and the B could be either one, depending on how you, which one you wanted to, to pull it into. So we pulled it in on the plat side. Um, we did not think that the townhomes that we had submit that we had originally submitted in our UZDP were, um, or in our pre-app, were were not going to be allowed. They said they were an allowed use, um, and so we had submitted those numbers for concurrency. Um, and we submitted the numbers for concurrency, we broke it up, one, one concurrency is the middle for the TCA1, so only those A zone parcels, 
and then we submitted another concurrency for the C and the B zone parcels. Okay. So now we are really to the point, essentially, of the configuration of the current UZDP application. Is that fair in terms of the property boundaries? Uh, yeah, I mean, we that that for the 11 4 2019 submittal, yes. So yes. Okay. we did our concurrency and then we start working um, to create, um, you know, to, to submit our application and pull all the other documents together for that application. Um, as, as part as part of this, would you would it be more fair to call this a feasibility review or a pre-application review stage? I'm not really sure what's appropriate there. Do you have a sense? Well, I mean, the pre-app is a condition of application. Okay, and so you were so formally in we're the formally, We're formally okay. applying. And keep in mind, this was the, this was the vehicle to get substantive comments back from the city that you know they could really start talking to us about an application and um, and again i think everybody's agreed this is a mandatory pre-application as opposed to an optional right yeah yeah you have to do that you have to do the pre-app you even apply you have to do the pre-app to get your to go to concurrency did the city as part of these discussions was the city talking or to you giving either giving you information or asking you for information about market conditions and what would be best suited um, in terms of of all of these different mixes of uses um no not that i recall okay so that was entirely on you to work through as far as what would function the best for each kind of component of your development scenarios yeah I, the only time you need to identify uses is when you submit your concurrency because different commercial uses have different traffic impacts so you are there you need to provide some uses for your to, in order to submit your concurrency and we had submitted on uh, retail use, uh, as well as um, some restaurant uses. Okay, but I want to make sure that I, I, I got my question across to you is, is um, in terms of market factors and what would make sense from filling the space type concepts, did the city ask you for information about that or did the city share any studies or information that it had compiled regarding um, how best to, I guess, put together the mix of uses here? Um, not that I recall, I don't. Okay, okay. I, don't, I just wanna I make sure that you understood my question there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're talking about it from a, you know, what would be economically viable or a need of the city or things like that, um, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't recall receiving um, documentation or uh, in any formal I guess, have you seen any uh, have you seen any work from the city in that regard ever i'm not fishing i'm just asking yeah i don't i don't believe so right. i don't believe right. i've seen a, a, an economic analysis and okay. what should be put there okay um okay so back to your time frame i believe you testified you're sort of in the middle of the six month period um putting us i guess in i think you were saying roughly august of 2019 yeah. is that right yeah. so Go ahead. you've you've worked through re revised the UCDP boundaries and now do you continue with the pre-application on really this now the now the meat's on the bone for really the exterior um boundaries for the UCDP yeah and i i think that something that's important to understand in the application is that the plat that was the the B and the C zone it works together with the A zone there so basically the the the, the bookends of that area are 222nd and 224th so i I appreciate that you're trying to say trying to isolate it on the UZDP but in our 
in our minds, we were putting together both because they both dovetail together. So it, even though you're going through two different application processes from the, if you were to look at the development from the outside, you'd be like, oh, okay, well, you know, between 222nd and 224th, this is a, a townhome and single family development. And then as we go across 224th and the 225th, we get into really the core mixed use area. So the, the, the challenge with the, the parcels was always that you spanned a C zone, a B zone, and an A zone in a 530 feet lineal. And I think there's a weird ticking talking. Um, what is it? Okay, one of it sounds like maybe we need to mute all callers. But um, so, so when you're talking about that continuum, that's the new that's the new block that was created as a result of the roundabouts. Yeah, I mean it, the 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 roundabouts shifting um, made two twenty fourth and two twenty fifth the logical. Um, uh, I guess north, north, uh, south roads. Um, but the then then but then you have uh, other you have other design considerations which are around um, block length and intersection length. Um, so these are components that um, are are in the interim town center standards as well as the Sammamish Municipal Code. But um, basically, the intersection spacing uh, is something where you need to be 250 feet minimum or 350 feet maximum. So there was that that block consideration is is one that we can we can talk about more later. But um, the so there was a lot of configuration components that you're trying to put together from a public work standpoint, and and then how do you where do you end the A zone? Well, you know, if that if the roundabouts were positioned per the TCIP, more logical uh, uh, point would have been right on the A B zone line. But the the roundabout shifted to the west, um, making the making the distance from the roundabout to the A B zone line uh, under the uh, block length uh, minimum. So that was also um, something that we needed to you need to consider in all these types of things. Um, so for the A zone that we were putting together, for the roundabouts, when you said those shifted, so those are now just to be clear in a different location than what the TCIP and I guess has in its drawings. Or was there was there was was that document amended? Do you know? No, no, that, not that I, the TCPIP hasn't been amended and the roundabouts were put in um, different location from the TCIP and the adopted town center plan. I think, uh, I think did Larry you, was going through some of those measurements. Did you, did you comment or ever, I mean, did the city ever talk to you about the location of those round, roundabouts? Was that, did that happen before you were aggregating the property? The city did talk to us about it, um, and I did have conversations with Public Works. Um, the problem was is that the city said to us that we we couldn't influence any design without an application. I see. So we were still in aggregation phase. We weren't totally into um, a phase where we had all the properties that were all touching Southeast Fourth. So it. It was a result of, you know, not having the ability to apply, and also potentially, I don't know if we had all the properties that all the roundabouts touched or influenced to then be able to say that our application would like these roundabouts in these locations. I guess, you know, there's there's a couple things. The city came in and to did right away acquisition from all the parts the landowners along southeast fourth um the 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 choice to where they put the roads um i think could have followed the tcip uh because they they came in and did right-of-way acquisitions um we received several checks from them on those right-of-way acquisitions so to 
to put it in, I guess, way public works had talked to us is that the, the 224th roundabout was set by the TRF project, which was approved before the Southeast 4th project had um, commenced. And the 224th roundabout was set by a northern road or e I, I guess it's an easement because I think we own the property, but there is it's just sketched on our property or uh, uh, an easement over the property for the 224th road. So, but those don't mirror roads to the south. So in my opinion, it was, if if you if it wasn't mirroring kind of both sides, then did we have any value in doing it just for one side? I guess 225th, I don't think the city had a choice at that point. They had already put TRF there. It was more of a slight adjustment on the roundabout um, that really doesn't affect our ability to put 226 where we where we did put it to the further to the east. So I think that was fine. Um, the west roundabout, though, definitely had an impact on our ability to put then another leg of street um, on that A, B zone line. Um, another thing that was important is that, and I think this is just a matter of probably the <laughs> where we were in the times, is that the city also, I believe, was operating off an extension from a federal grant or a, a state grant that they had for the for getting money for Southeast 4th. Okay. So we don't need, I mean, unless that's relevant to this project, we don't have to Well, I think the only relevancy is that we then couldn't catch up with aggregation and and then implement Southeast Fourth together. Because as you can see, Southeast see. Fourth is now in and there's no development around it. So why is Southeast Fourth in so much earlier than than when any development can come or, or could it have been um, postponed a little bit and I don't think that um, I think that was a factor of some some funds that were necessary to get uh, get through and get the project done. We appreciate that the project is done because that does provide a, a major artery uh, that goes through the center of the town center for the uh, northwest and southwest quadrants. However, I'm sure if we were to all do it today and, and plan it together, we might have made some adjustments on it. Okay, fair enough. So you were talking about. Um, the relationship of the UCDP and the BNC zones to the west. Um, mm -hmm. I think you, I think you covered that. Um, I want to make sure you did. And if so, um, well, it's 4:30, Mr. Examiner. I do, I, I do have a fair number of questions. We can keep on going. I, I'd like a little guidance from the examiner as to how he'd like to, when we plan to wrap up, where we want to go with the day. Well, we need to be through by five o'clock, as I understand it from the uh, way back when we set this up. Uh, there's a city council meeting of some sort going on um, in the council chambers. I guess it starts at six or six thirty or something. And the folks from the city who are in there now have to bail out and clean up that room and get it ready for whatever is going to happen later. So I will not let us go two minutes beyond five o'clock. But I see no reason why you can't keep asking questions of your witness until we get to say five minutes of five. Okay. And then tomorrow morning, I, I, I guess I'll ask this now because I just don't want to get like two minutes to five and us we're trying to quickly strategize. Look, tomorrow morning, uh, the subpoena for Mr. Maxim says he's to report at nine o'clock. I think out of courtesy to him having been subpoenaed, we should take him on regardless of where we are with anybody else. Mr. Brennan, can you just confirm you're available um, to come back whenever um, the examiner calls you? I am here. Okay. All right. Okay. I think that cleans everything up. Thank you, Mr. Examiner. So, Mr. Brennan, um, we keep sort of departing and coming back to <laughs> the permitting process so let's come back to um the the work that you're doing to put together to finish up the pre-application process for the uzdp so, um, right. so just we're in go ahead the pre-app is done we we talked about the city square meeting and then the the, the what the results of that and the decision then to adjust kind of how we would apply 
for an application omitting blocks eight and nine. Um, okay. The design, I think you were asking just a little bit about the B and C and if we were uh, done with that. I think what was important there was that we landed on that, those blocks. I think um, if, if, if Dean has um, maybe that zoning map there, I think it, I think there, or maybe a. Uh, That's one oh three one page six. Yeah, I wanted to get something from our November fourth application that kind of showed um, showed the entire project. But um, I think you know what's what what we landed on here, and I think if we can zoom in on um, the C and B. So basically 224th, you can see where that roundabout is. It then it then cuts through that um, that A1 zone property. Just the design decision on the C, B, and A parcels there as you as you go across this 530 lineal feet. One of the the, the city was also very adamant that units needed to stay within their their zone so if the c zone has a max density of 19 units you needed to put it in the c zone b zone has a max of however many units you have to put it in the b zone and the same with the a zone so the way we looked at this area here um, was to create townhomes that um would uh, would go in a north-south direction, so we could stay within the the different zone areas, and we could also meet side setback requirements between zones, and um, it just had a lot of complexity with it. Um, so that was a component that was necessary for us on the A1 zone for our application for the the townhome component. And then when we get to 224th, um, I think yes, we can now go to the, like I said, we're we're not on the November 4th application, but we went to the the A1 zone and it's blocks five, six, and seven as you've seen them there today or on this application. So um, those units, uh, those blocks stayed similar as they have been from our first application. Um, we ended up applying in the, I believe, for the 11-4 application. I believe we applied on 300 apartment. I think it was 33 or 34 townhomes and 82,000 square feet of commercial. Uh, on blocks five, six, seven, it was 300 apartments and the 82,000 square feet of commercial. Um, and I also want to make sure that we're we're clear that there was um, there was two applicants for that application. There was STCA and STCJV1. So, um, and that is relevant only because the parcel to the far uh, west in the A1 is an STCA owned parcel, and the other four parcels that we applied on then were um, STCJV1. Okay. Um, what happened, by the way, with that configuration? Can you be more specific? Well, you were talking about this configuration that had a different number of townhomes that you had put in an application for on November 4th. Right, so we put that application in um and then uh it turns over to the city and i think if i can just back up a a, a bit duana sure. um leading up to that application submittal um sure i want to make sure i'm going to put a note for myself though because i don't want to lose that so that we can finish the oh great thanks dean that's perfect so okay. that's what the that's what it looked like for what, um, what, before we go any further, what document number, Dean? This is document, thir exhibit number, excuse me, 13C is in CAT, page eight. So 
just to orient everybody, we have, as you can see, another block structure here, which is one, two, three, and then four is now the current block eight. So you can see it, you know, it changes as we make, as we get comments and we make decisions. Um, and um, so, So we um, just leading up to this, there were still a lot of questions that um, we had with the city and in order to just finalize on a design and allow us to be able to, to submit. And um, I think the, um, yeah, the important part on that was that we had some, some lead up meetings um, around September okay. with, um, with the city that um, we had met um, with, um, we had met with Andrew Zagers, who was um, the city's engineer uh, on 9-9. And we had talked with um, Andrew just about some of the complexities, um, the roundabout shifts um, and the challenges that we were having. And we talked a little bit about um, perhaps some needed deviations that we would, um, Mr. Zagers is in the Public Works Department, is that right? Yeah, he was oh. the city engineer uh, in Public Works at the time. I don't believe he um, works at the city any longer. Um, we also, uh, Darcy Donovan and Chris Hankins were also there. So we were, we met and we talked a bit about some of the challenges and whatnot. Uh, we talked about how uh, the, um, that we may need some deviations in order to achieve this design. We had recognized that the design that we were, that uh, Dean had just uh, shown had some uh, irregular block lengths that were not, uh, were not part of what the city, uh, the city's 2010 interim public work standards uh, would allow, um, or that, that wasn't part of the standards and that we wanted to make sure that if we were, if we were to provide a deviation, how would that be received by the city? And uh, Andrew was very, you know, uh, under, understanding of our position and said that you know, deviations, submit them and provide your engineering, um, you know, your sound engineering. So, um, and so we did. We took that advice and we provided some deviations, which we thought had some sound engineering to them. Um, we also had a meeting with uh, Darcy Donovan and Chris Hankins on that same day. Um, where we were talking about um, really what is the best format for us to get our narrative across, uh, code compliance. Um, and on, on that, in that meeting, um, they uh, really expressed to us that the design companion that was done for the Plateau 120 project was an excellent example and one that we should follow for our, for our application because it it definitely was succinct, it was clear, and um, one that they could follow to uh, you know, sh ins ensure code compliance. Okay. And so that was kind of the model that we used, that Larry used for his design companion. Um, we had also talked with Chris about um, the pedestrian oriented mixed use streets and that our desire was to put 224th as a mixed use street. And we did not receive an objection to that. Let me pause you. I just want to pull up one exhibit and I don't have the number saved for it in my mic. Just have a quick one here. I'm going to okay. look at a binder up. Dean, can you pull up? Exhibit 1002B as in boy. Okay, so just, just to be clear, so that is the design companion that you were just referring to that, that staff oriented you to follow? That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, and then I don't need you to pull this up, Dean, but um, all right. 
right. And it's your, well, and that, so that particular Plateau 120 was an approved project um, through the UCDP. Okay. All right, we can pull that down and keep going. I just wanted to make sure that we were looking at the same document. So you know, some of the challenges that we were facing, we had had the meeting with Andrew Zagers. We um, were under, we understood that we could submit deviations, um, but you know, we, we definitely had to provide our justification for them. Um, we had met with Darcy and Chris. We had um, received a good example of how to, how to formulate our code narrative with design companion. Uh, we had talked about the mixed use street on 224th and received no objection. And, um, you know, and Chris though, um, you know, I think he, he was just, he understood that there were challenges between public works, uh, the, the public works standards and um, how to design. Uh, I'll ask the witness, witness can, this, this witness can testify as to his understanding. He can't testify as to Mr. Donovan's understanding. That's my objection. I'll sustain that. Thank you. Fair Mr. Enough. Brennan, yes, if you could talk about um, both your understanding of the meeting and your uh, impressions as opposed to what you may think someone else is thinking. Yeah, I mean, we can just drop that. So um, yeah. the, the next meeting that we had was on October 7th, which was a, um, a public works meeting to talk about uh, our storm design. And um, obviously, uh, in this scenario, uh, we were we were concerned with our storm design because the we were we were not working from a regional stormwater solution. Um, basically, uh, because we were advancing our application without the the notch property and further discussions with the city, uh, it was our understanding that then all stormwater had to be on our own property. Uh, and so we uh, had our, our concept there, which I knew, uh, I'm going to let Holly talk to more, but basically at a high level, we were talking with the city about the ability to commingle um, some private and public water in vaults that would be located in the right of way. And we were not receiving uh, any objections to that design um at that meeting and that meeting had um had public work staff um and then also kelly hildy chris hankins uh my whole uh, engineering team at the time so we had two in, in engineering firms at the time we had uh holly uh heaven from core uh we had rob gagne and tim brockway from uh coughlin porter lundeen and leif hermanson was also there so um we went through and and explained our stormwater system and um, and felt like we were getting uh, good positive feedback from the public works team on that. Um, we also, there also was a comment in there from uh, Kelly and Chris that they proposed a potential design uh, option as like, hey, could we do townhomes that could front a common courtyard and then put stormwater vaults in the common courtyard, um, which we would 100% agree with that. Um, that type of configuration, um, but uh, Public Works was quick to um, make sure that we knew that uh, townhomes needed to front that were alley loaded needed a front onto a right away. So that uh, that idea was uh, not an option uh, coming out of that meeting. Okay, but but yet you do have sort of a design where there is a park area in the center of the townhomes, isn't that right? Um, that is for our next application. So not the 11th okay. um, That's right, because we were, you had. <laughs> we feel like we were under different, different guidance for that particular application. Okay. All right, so. Um, so with, no all those, with all those yeah. components, I guess, uh, Duana, we were then able to finalize the details of our design and advance a uh, UZDP application, a um, binding site plan, 
for the commercial spaces that were that for all the commercial uh, the 82,000 square feet of commercial and the apartment space and, and then we were able to advance a brownstones east plat for our townhome units and that was submitted on the 4th of November 2019 as well as then we were able to um, we also submitted our plat for the TCB and the TCC zone on okay. the same day. So what happened then with that 11-4 submittal and how did we end up with the 11-19 submittal? 11-19. Or do I have the right date for, pardon me, 11-17. Are you talking about then the, the next submittal? Or? Well, so you just testified that you that you took all of that work with these various pre-application meetings and put it into that submittal on 11-4. What happened with that submittal? Uh, then it was on the city side to then review. Mm -hmm. Did you get any review? Oh, we yes, we got we got comments back on uh, March 10th. 2020. Okay. We did not get any um, any requests for clarification or anything with our application from that. Okay. From so, our, so you went through then the process of notice of application, the various notices of completeness, all those documents that are in the record. Um, is that right? We did a neighborhood meeting. Okay. And I, during the submittal of materials, were you ever told to do any sort of like a matrix or comparison or a listing of all the town center policies and um, your analysis related to those town center policies? No. Did you ever see if anybody else in the other UCDPs that were approved were asked to do that type of, um, I guess, goal and policy by policy analysis? Not, not to a policy by policy analysis. I think the overarching guidance that we were under was that um, there was, you needed to show, um, connections to goals and policies, but I was never under the impression that it was a, you needed to show connection to every goal and policy or that there was some formula that said, if you met 50% uh, of the policies, you were uh, okay, or you met 25 or you met 75. I, there was no criteria for how many goals and policies equated to a successful application. Okay, I just need one moment to check my notes here before we go on. I could just have one quick moment. So, this is a probably a perfect place to pause Mr. Examiner because now I'm going to be asking him questions that are really blocked for the um, comments, resubmittal, etc. I'm a little concerned if I start down that road it's going to be strange to pick up in with witnesses intervening if I can just make the pause here. That's fine. Okay. Uh, we will then break for today. We will reconvene tomorrow morning at nine o'clock via GoToMeeting. Uh, you use the same access code uh, that we used for today. It, I've been told it will be the same access code for all of our sessions. Uh, we are starting tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock with the testimony of the subpoenaed witness. And then we'll come back to Mr. Brennan uh, as soon as we conclude that other. Uh, since this Continuation is to a date, time, and manner certain. Uh, there is no need for any further public notice, nor will any be given. 
I see Mr. Iglick catching my eyes because he wants to ask or do something before I recess for the night. Mr. Eglick. Yes, and, and um, uh, even though they're going to be cleaning up the room here, I'm going to personally guard this microphone so that we have no problems tomorrow. So <laughs> maybe even take it home um, if I don't get caught. Uh, the, what, what I wanted to ask is, can we get an idea of... Don't take it home because it needs to sit on the charger tonight. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, what, what what I wanted to ask is, uh, do we know what the lineup is tomorrow? And I know it's Mr. Maxim, then we'd uh, finish up uh, with Mr. Brennan, but who's next up? Sure. Um, then we have, so Mr. Maxim, Mr. Brennan, um, and I'm a good, I mean, I'm a really good chunk of the way through with Mr. Um, Brennan. I'm at least two thirds, so. That's the good news there. Um, then uh, Holly Hevron, who is our engineer. And um, I'm not sure if we will need very short testimony from uh, Mr. Koger or not. Well, uh, there was a question typed in what I would call the chat system from uh, Kent Treen. Uh, who's been observing his question was, when will the public get to testify? Uh, the answer is I announced at the beginning of the hearing that in accordance with the pre-hearing conference agreement way back whenever it was this spring, uh, the public testimony will be taken starting at 9 a.m. next Monday morning. Even if the hearing were to otherwise conclude before then, I will reconvene the hearing at nine o'clock next Monday morning to take public testimony. Public testimony will be limited to five minutes per person. Uh, time is not um, accumulatable and you can't transfer it to other people. But anyway, bottom line, public testimony starts 9 a.m. Uh, next Monday, The I think it's the 19th. Uh, anything else before we, uh, Mr. Reglick, did you get the info you needed? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. Uh, then we stand at recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you.